All right, I'd like to call to order the uh, January 14th. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, 2013 meeting of the San Carlos City Council. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Changes to the order of the agenda. Do we have any uh, changes? No changes this evening from staff, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Council communications and announcements. Uh, where should we start? Anybody ready for that? Nothing. Karen's trying to think. Uh, Mr. Brasilli, you got anything? Nothing. Mr. Collins. Nope. Ms. Clapper? I'm drawing a complete Help me out here. I'm drawing a complete blank on what complete I was going to say because I didn't. <laughs> okay. Well. Maybe we'll come back to this at the end yeah. of the meeting. Okay. Uh, the only item I had is uh, something that I had called the mayor about um, over the holiday season. And I think, the, well, no, I called you and I talked to the mayor. Uh, or, excuse me, yeah. the. Now you're confusing me. I talked to the vice mayor and I talked to the city manager about um, the uh, traffic enforcement over the holidays because it was my memory that we had adjusted that uh, at one point and I saw our traffic control people out there on Christmas Eve and so I've asked the city manager to look into that and bring back something for us to discuss. Is that is that where we are with that? That that is where we are, and and in fact, um, I'll send an e uh, email with, with the attachment out to the entire council. But we do have resolution. You're correct. That was a change the council made a number of years ago, and then the council made a second change and they changed it back. Okay, so we're back current, to the current status is enforcement on Christmas Eve. So. Okay, all right. So we may want to see that again and take another look at it. Is, and that's what we're going to do is we're going to bring it back for a discussion item? Um, that's not the plan right now for the council to bring it back for a discussion item. It was just to answer the history. If the council would like it to come back, then we'd look for direction from the council this evening on whether or not they'd like to agendize that topic in the future. Okay. So right now we're, we are not, we, we don't overlook uh, traffic enforcement on Christmas Eve and uh, I guess New Year's Eve. Correct. But we, we could. All right. Well, I'll just leave it there. If somebody wants to uh, have that discussed, speak up now, I guess, uh, if you want to take a look at that. Or you can bring it up another time if you want to think about it. But that's where we are right now. Okay. Um, and then the only other thing is I just wanted folks to know that we do have the uh, State of the City address. It's uh, a little out there. There's other things. There's uh, in January we have... Uh, an event. I don't know what, what do we call that, uh, Greg. The uh, where we're going to be awarding Mr. Eaton his recognition re gala. Rec oh, rec Chamber of Commerce Recognition Gala. That's right. Yeah, I only picked on Greg because he's looking right at me. So uh, that is coming up in January. You January can January twenty second, and you can get tickets for that if you're interested in attending uh, through the Chamber of Commerce. It'll be over at the Hotel Sofitel. Um, and then uh, a little further out in February, on February 21st, is the State of the City Address. That'll be, uh, I think, 5.30 to 7.30 at the Hiller Aviation Museum. So you might want to mark your calendars. And that's given Ms. Clapper enough time to think. Yes. Here she comes. <laughs> Thank you for letting me collect my brain cells together. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to mention was I went to the, uh, the CERT holiday uh, potluck supper that they had in uh, December. And it was uh, really great to see people come together from Belmont, Redwood City, San Carlos, Redwood Shores, uh, people that have gone through the CERT training uh, for you know, emergency preparedness 
over the years. Some of them are a group of, um, came out of the group of 40 who were just recently trained. And a really, really neat to see the camaraderie of that group spanning across the different communities. And I just wanted to commend uh, Jim Skinner and uh, Christy Adonis for providing the inspiration for keeping the community group together like that. It was, it was really great to see. And the other thing I wanted to share is um, I received a, a notice about a uh, presentation of the, um, from the Sierra Club Sustainable Land Use Committee um, that's going to look at their, the Sierra Club Sustainable Land Use Guidelines. And that's going to be presented this uh, Saturday, January 19th from 10 until noon in the Menlo Park Library meeting room. And uh, we'll look at best practices in transit-oriented development um, with uh, guidelines recommending practices and features to make projects near transit livable, green, and minimize car traffic. So for anyone who is interested in that. Those are my two items. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that moves us to item four, which is public comment. It's an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items that aren't on the agenda. And I think I have one speaker card uh, from Jenny Zhang. You'd like to come up? Wow. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Jenny, Jenny Zhang. I'm actually a volunteer from San Francisco. And today I'm here to invite our mayor, vice mayor, and you know the council member to Shen Yun performance. It's the best classical Chinese dance and music performance in the world. Yeah, well, you know, um, Shenyun comes from a non-profitable organization in New York, and they travel around the world, try to revive the 5,000 years of civilization of China, which, you know, already got dis destroyed by the communists in China in the past century. So, um, you know, in March, they will come to San Francisco, to the Alphen Theater, and you will see more than 100 artists perform here with you know, a live orchestra which combines the Eastern and Western instrument together. And you will see you know, like more than a, a 400 sets of beautiful costumes, all handmade, all original. And they bring lots of myths and legends on stage in life. And you know, this is the thing. Um, well, actually, you know, the, the audience found the show not just you know, like, um, I mean, beautiful and entertaining, but also uplifting and inspiring as well, as they present the universal value and, you know, the ancient wisdom from China, like, you know, respect to parents, loyalty and dignity, the truthfulness, compassion, and all this message. So, you know, they go so, so down in Lincoln Center, Kennedy Center, and some of the top values in the world. And in early January, they come to, um, San Jose and also Sacramento, they got sold out as well. They just finished a tour in Argentina. They had eight performances there, and people just love it. And everybody, when they went to Canada, you know, the prime minister and the senior government officials give them the highest prize. Yeah. So. Uh, so very good. So that, uh, if just to summarize, then there's a there's a performance you said in San Jose. Uh, they already uh, had a. They already had that. Okay, so the next one coming up is in March in San Francisco. March, San Francisco. March. Yeah. Uh, uh, from the 23rd to the 27th. 23rd to the 27th. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. And thank you for coming and letting us know. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. That. I actually have a. a well, okay, I cannot display the video. So um, here's the newspaper. I have like, sorry, I only have four copies, but I can share with everybody. Yeah. Thank very you. Very good. So much. Thank, thank you very much. And I hope. Everybody can make it for March and, you know, to support a noble mission as well. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> we have another speaker. We do. Uh, so we have another speaker for public comment. Dimitri uh, Vendelos. Vendelos, sorry. Couldn't read that quite right. Hi. Um, just a, a quick point. Um, in uh, along uh, East San Carlos Avenue on um, on the east side, uh, there are a number of Quonset huts, um, and and there's been you know quite a bit of turnover in, in the businesses that are in there. Uh, those Quonset huts don't have any insulation. They don't have any, uh, you know, they're 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 not up to date. And uh, what what I'd like to request is that the, the council uh, consider. Um, 
conditional use permits whenever there's a new business moving in to ensure that what's there isn't isn't going to create problems with the existing neighborhood and, and that's it just just an idea thanks thank you all right uh, that concludes public comment I don't have any other speaker cards for that portion uh, next item is item 5 uh, which is uh, reports to council from staff Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, Christine Boland, Director of Community Relations and City Clerk. Tonight I'm here to provide a brief report on the upcoming vacancies on the Transportation and Circulation Commission. This commission is actually comprised of a, it's actually a result of combining the former Bicycle Pedestrian Committee and the former, former Traffic Commission. Each was a five-member commission and it morphed into the Transportation and Circulation Commission for a seven-member commission. As you recall, back in 2010, the council reduced the number of years a commissioner can serve down from nine years to six years now. And in exchange, a volunteer could apply for another commission to serve as a new six years without penalty. So the bottom line is we have four transportation commissioners terming out in March. Staff has begun, begun the recruitment for these vacancies, and you'll be conducting interviews around that time, late February, March. That concludes my brief presentation. I'm happy to clarify any points I've made tonight. As an aside, we've, we're actually scheduling a volunteer recognition in May, so we can volunteer present, um, so we can recognize current and past commissioners for their volunteer service to the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I do have uh, three speakers on this item: um, Margaret Pye, Jack Baumgartner, and uh, Thomas Felity. Hello, I'm Margaret Pye. I'm currently the chairperson for the Transportation and Circulation Commission. I'm pretty alarmed about the fact that of the five of us, four are due to be termed out in one, in about a month. Um, I think this is going to be devastating to the city to have all this experience and um, hardworking people with um, a background with the Transportation Commission all departing at the same time. I also think it's going to be a lot of work for the Public Works Department and for you all to interview that many new candidates. Um, I also feel sorry for Jay Walter, our fairly new public works director, because he would have to be orienting four new commissioners all at the same time. Um, I, I'm really hoping that you can um, come up with some kind of a loophole in municipal code or some kind of an exception that will allow at least a couple of us to remain serving on the commission for a transitional period until the new people become more experienced. Um, in addition to that, I just wanted to mention that I'm actually against term limits as a concept. I just don't understand what purpose is served by having um, the four of us who are very hardworking and experienced people who have devoted the last six years uh, to becoming knowledgeable and um, experienced in this area, the transportation of the city of San Carlos, having us all depart at once to have four new people participate. Um, it, it just, I don't see any upside to having term limits. Um, but the municipal code seems to have a discrepancy in it because the section that pertains to the Transportation Commission specifically does say that we're allowed nine years, three three-year terms. Um, I understand that municipal code also says that all commissioners in the city only have two three-year terms. So um, that discrepancy was is why some of us didn't realize until very recently that we that the four of us were going to have to leave. So I'm imploring you to come up with some kind of an exception so that we don't have don't lose four of the five of us at once thank you thank you jack uh, baumgartner and uh then thomas uh, felity mr mayor council members uh, jack baumgartner i've been a resident of san carlos for 27 years i live at 291 chestnut street uh I've been a member of the Transportation and Circulation Commission for almost six years. Uh, I'm not here to repeat what Margaret just said. Uh, I do want to offer a recommendation, however. Uh, before I do that, let me, I'd like to name a, uh, 
tell you a little bit about this commission. Uh, it's not just an advisory group that meets once in a while and gives advice to staff. Uh, this group uh, has gone out and been hands-on. They've uh, done a lot of work for the Public Works Department, for various groups like uh, Safe Routes of Schools and others. I'm going to name a few. Uh, for example, early on, uh, we all went out and surveyed each of the schools in San Carlos to identify requirements for crosswalks, curb, curb cuts for people with disabilities and women with strollers. Uh, a lot of that was used over the years to identify intersections that needed work. Uh, we surveyed all the bicycle lanes up and down Old County Road and actually did a design of the, of the lanes and the parking situation and that led to the grant that's leading to uh, the East Side Connectivity Project that's coming up soon. Uh, we participated in the Holly 101 study to try and make that a better, uh, more accessible route for people to come and go from the east and west side of San Carlos and we're still fighting that battle. Uh, we worked with parent schools at White Oaks and Arendelle uh, setting up the original Safe Routes to School program and also tr going out to get some money to support some of those programs. Uh, we started with Hometown Days and the Art Fair and other San Carlos functions, actually going out and running, setting up the bike parking and running it ourselves. Uh, we prepared and coordinated and wrote and coordinated the whole bicycle transportation plan, which will be the basis for grants and monies going forward for traffic and street improvements in the future for many years. Uh, and we've worked with the Public Works Director for, on many, many other projects. So it's more, we're more than just an advisory group. And this particular set of people are particularly attuned to the regulations that uh, regard bicycles and cars and traffic and things that go on in this city. So a lot of experience there that helps. Uh, so uh, what I recommend is if you decide to do something, as Margaret suggested, the, probably the most obvious thing is say, well, let's keep two of, them and, and two of them and extend them for a year or two. Okay, I'm recommending that you don't do that that you extend all four of the people for a period respectively of one for one year, two for two years, and one for three years. That has a lot of advantages. One, there'll be a continuity of all these projects like Transit Village, Wheeler Plaza, Holly 101, and East Side Connectivity Project. It'll provide for a better overlap of the old and the new. It'll make recruiting a heck of a lot easier and give everybody more time to get the right people into this because three of us on this commission are bicycle and pedestrian advocates. We go to a lot of meetings with other groups involving these programs. Uh, well, finally, if you just toss all this out and you decide to let all four of us go, you need to figure out some way to keep the gal that just talked in front of me, Margaret Pye, on the, on the uh, commission. Uh, she's... Uh, she does an extraordinary amount of work and puts in an incredible amount of time and effort for the good of this city. And if you lose her, you're really losing a tremendous asset. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Tom Felody. I've been a San Carlos resident since 1993 and a member of the Traffic and Circulation Commission uh, back when it was first called the uh, Traffic and Transportation uh, Committee, I think, uh, since um, uh, 2007. And I, uh, I, I can't uh, repeat or, or, or do better than what uh, my uh, previous two speakers have said about this commission. But uh, all I can say is that uh, one of the things about San Carlos that I think I like and many of the residents do is that there's a, a, a nice blend uh, between the, uh, the various modes of transportation, and it's kind of what keeps this city uh, alive and vibrant uh, without becoming too, um, too much like uh, Palo Alto, perhaps, or, or Burlingame, or some of the other uh, cities and towns up and down the peninsula. And so the, the commission members that are currently sitting uh, have developed a balance and a feel for this, this, uh, this environment that uh, San Carlos residents seem to like. And uh, I think that's probably what you're going you're gonna to miss or, 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 or lose if, you, if four out of the five of us get termed out right away. Um, so as was mentioned here previously, you have various options available to you. Uh, one that uh, perhaps uh, is also worth mentioning is, is the fact that the, the rule that's currently written with regard to term limits 
um, is, uh, is, could be modified to some extent to, uh, to take into account this particular situation so that um, if you, uh, you've decided the term limits are what you want, uh, you can have them, but, um, but also provide there uh, some means of escape so that if uh, more than a majority of members of a commission are being termed out, that, uh, that there's an, ex uh, an additional part of that regulation that says that some of the members can be retained. So this will allow you to keep the current regulation as it is uh, with just a small addition to it uh, to uh, prevent the kind of disaster that we foresee here. Um, you you kind of got to wonder to yourselves why uh, the members of this commission who, you know, don't get paid to, to spend their hours, uh, uh, you know, uh, once a month with them uh, at various meetings and so on. Our last meeting uh, went till I think, 10.30 or so. Um, um, so why do we do it? Because we like it and we really think we're contributing something to the city. And we want to continue doing that. We want the new members to be able to do it as well. But uh, to term out four out of the five of us uh, at one shot, I think is going to be a big disaster. Uh, so uh, we appreciate your consideration in the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So what I'd like to suggest to the council after hearing this is uh, you would like to speak on this item? I'm a clear St. Carlos resident since 1958. I didn't know this was going to be discussed, but I, I do want to echo their concern because I've been to the different uh, commission meetings and uh, they do seem to be very knowledgeable and they don't have very many people that usually come to those meetings. So you probably don't have a very big backlog of people that would be really qualified to fill those seats. So I hope that you will figure something out. I, I feel a new connection with Bonnie. I was born in 1958. <laughs> I don't know if she heard that. But <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> we used to be neighbors. So, okay. yeah. All right. Uh, I think the city manager wanted to. Yeah, I'd just like to point a clarification, if I may. It was mentioned that there's a discrepancy within the municipal code on this item. And there is technically, but the legislative intent is that the, the last action of the council is to apply term limits to all the commissions in terms of uh, six year uh, time frame. So what would be required is an introduction. If the council wanted to change this, the real issue here is the council's policy uh, which is codified on term limits for commissioners. So if there's a desire on the council to take action on this item, we would need to get direction tonight to agendize uh, at the next meeting the introduction of an ordinance uh, amending the code to allow the council to extend commissioners beyond the current six years, which is the, the hard and fast deadline in the municipal code. And that would take 30 days from introduction to go into effect, so it could go into effect by the end of February. So does that mean that it, there is an action we could take that would impact these particular seats, or no? There is an action you can take that would allow you to, to uh, continue the current constitution of the Traffic and Circulation Commission okay. at the next two council meetings. All right. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Um, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. We could, we could take an action that would, for example, extend these terms uh, indefinitely or on a short-term basis until we can revisit the entire concept of our term limits. Is that correct? That, that's correct. You could do one or both. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, I personally would like to do that. If, if you don't mind, I'd just like to take a minute and mention that I've been on two commissions myself. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a rewarding job, and it's, but it's a, thank, it's a thankless job. I was on the Planning Commission when no one came to meetings, and I was on EDAC when no one came to meetings. But a lot of important things are discussed, as, uh, as Mr. Baumgartner said. Um, these people come to the, I mean, these people come to these commissions as volunteers, and, and 
they have a lot of knowledge. I know that uh, I leaned heavily on the other planning commissioners when I was first on. It took me one or two years to get my sea legs. Same thing with EDAC, although I wasn't on it very long had I stayed. Uh, I, I very much value the other having other people who have been on a long term. Frankly, I don't know why we changed this in the first place. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind going back to the old system where you served nine years, you were reappointed after three, you know, three-year terms. I, I, I would like us to have that discussion and put it on a future agenda. Now, how we go about, um, uh, you know, straightening out the, the issue tonight, um, and, and if anybody wants to amend this, I, I welcome it. But I would like to propose that. We extend the terms of the existing commissioners indefinitely until we can figure out a, a, a longer term solution. This okay. item is not on for action this evening. Right. Okay. So right. you can give us that direction that at the next meeting that you'd like to see an item come forward that reflects that recommendation. All right. Then I, that's, let, let me take a shot at that's this. That's what I'd like to do. What, I, what I'd like to see on the next agenda is an item that for action that would address this circumstance specifically. Uh, number two, that would allow us to discuss the policy of term limits, as Ms. Pai mentioned. Uh, and number three, to address uh, and, and possibly take action on something that would address the circumstances generally that apply to this kind of situation where you, and it doesn't have, you know, this happens, you know, once in a blue moon, where you might have uh, a majority of a commission being termed out if we even kept term limits. But if we are going to keep term limits, where you run into this kind of situation, this was uniquely circumstantial to some conditions of uh, reducing a commission and folding two commissions in together that used to be uh, separate, so forth. But I think um, Mr. Felity points out that there's a you know, we need to have something codified so that if this ever happens again, there's direction on how to how to do it. So, if we could do that, um, and if that's okay with the council, sounds fine with everybody. Yes, sir. Um, if I may, Mr. Barrett, I wouldn't mind finding out in the report that comes back next time with the recommendations for um, actions that we can take. Um, I wouldn't mind finding out if there are any other circumstances like this that are currently foreseeable. Um, and um, it would probably also be worth, uh, or I would like to know a little bit uh, of the history of it, of how we ended up in the situation. Um, it, it just, I think we're all, um, we can all agree it's an odd and less than desirable situation. So I'd, I'd like to understand, is it likely to occur anywhere else? What caused it to happen this time? And how do we make sure it doesn't happen again? Well, I was going to say, what caused it to happen, I think, is the, is, as the bear said, is the combination of those two uh, groups. And the, what is it, the law of unintended consequences, where we wanted to have the, the council at the time felt that we wanted to get as many people involved in city government as possible. Mm -hmm. And so we, that's why we set the six years. I can't remember whether Mayor Brokott and I voted for it or against it. I don't remember how we did, but the, the, there was a majority of the council that felt we should, we should have that to get a lot of participation. And it's extremely unusual for... for I guarantee you we'd, those four people were not appointed. In fact, I'm, I would imagine that some of them might have been on more than six years. I don't know uh, if you have or if they have or haven't, but it was yeah. a combination of bridging those two, I believe. Yeah, and I, I believe if you went to the original bicycle pedestrian committee and counted those right. it'd be, time, it would be greater than greater, six years. Greater, and that's why we fell into this. All right. of a sudden, people, when the time we started counting, and we said, well, now there's four. Four, four folks. Yeah, I, th I think the unique situation was created by the fact that this commission was created, created. right? Only six years. But anyway, ago, the, so. the reason to answer your, your question is the reason we it was set for six years is because we wanted the council at the time felt that we wanted to get more participation. People would serve six years, then we get other people to come on. And again, nobody ever intended for four or five all at once to have happen. It's, it's you know, hopefully you have staggered terms, and that's what you know. And like I said, a law of unintended consequences because of the merger. I think that's what happened on this one. Mm -hmm. So I'm more. Than, I agree with. We should discuss this on, on the, at the next agenda and see if we can come to some adjudication of fairness. Very good. Thank you very I much. Just make one last. Well, just one last comment. Uh, just a thank you to to Margaret and Jack and Tom for your service. Uh, it's it's uh, a job that a lot of people don't want, um, even though it's very rewarding. And and I just want to publicly thank you for the work that you do for the city. And I hope you continue.
Thank you. That brings us to item six, which uh, is approval. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'd just oh. like to um, sorry make a, a report to council um, that out of the we had a closed session at the special oh, meeting, yes. and uh, there was one action that um, uh, is required to be disclosed. And I I did make the announcement at the end of the special meeting, but um, it's been my practice to announce it at this meeting as well, so the public's informed of uh, those types of decisions. And the council. Um, under a, a threatened uh, litigation item, uh, made a decision to, um, if required, initiate litigation um, over an issue um, involving CalPERS interpretation of um, and decision regarding the risk pool for uh, public safety employees in San Carlos. Um, that, um, if it's required, um, you've authorized us to initiate that litigation. Thank you for for uh, reporting on that. Okay, now we're done with reports to council, correct? Okay. All right, that bring, brings us to item six, which is approval of the consent calendar. All the items in the consent calendar are, if you will, in a basket, and we approve that basket unless somebody wants to remove something from it. Anybody? I'm not seeing anything, so we can. Mr. Mayor, I move approval together. of the consent calendar. Can you, if you would, just enumerate the items like A through H. Or um, uh, Mr. Mayor, I move um, approval of consent calendar items 6A through 6H. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Councilmember Clapper? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Mayor Grocott? Yes. All right. That brings us to item. 7A, but before we get to that, I do, I've got a um, speaker slip. It says agenda item San Carlos TV, so I'm not sure if that's, I think that's I think public it's, comment it's or. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Sorry. Oh, San Carlos Transit Village. I see. Uh, you know, I just grew up in the era where TVs were really something. Now it's iPads and everything else, so uh, I get it. All right. That's Transit Village, not TV. Very good. Okay, so that does bring us to item 7A. Uh, this is a public hearing, and it's consideration of a general plan map amendment and zoning district bounding map amendment to allow for the pre-zoning and annexation of 60 and 68 Loma Road. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Stephanie Bertolo Davis, Senior Planner. Tonight there is a public hearing request in front of you for a pre-zoning and annexation at 60 and 68 Loma Road. Uh, just a brief overview of the annexation process itself. It is a multi-step process. All annexations required to um, or requesting to come in to the City of San Carlos require both an amendment to the City's general plan map as well as the zoning district boundary map. Uh, the first step was completed in November of 2012. That was review and consideration by the Planning Commission of both of those entitlements. The Planning Commission did review and recommend the Council approval. The next step before you tonight for consideration of those same two requests. Uh, following a decision and if an approval is granted, the next step is the property tax exchange between the City and the County of San Mateo, which also will require further action um, by the Council. The last step to solidify an annexation is the actual annexation request with the San Mateo County Local Agency Formation Commission. That's a state mandated agency um, countywide that is responsible for changes in district boundaries. Brief uh, description of the site itself. Um, it's two parcels. They are dashed and outlined here. Parcel A, 60 Loma. Parcel B, 68 Loma. Uh, the primary intent of this annexation request is due to a failing septic system at 60 Loma Road. Um, due to the age of that septic system and the existing physical conditions of the site, it's very steep and very heavily vegetated, um, as well as, again, the age of the system, uh, repairs to it um, have been determined to be um, very difficult, if not infeasible, as certified um, with conversations with the San Mateo County Environmental Health Division. Uh, staff has been in contact with agencies, applicable agencies in the county of San Mateo, and those agencies do support this application. <clears throat> it's 
So the first entitlement request, the general plan map amendment. Um, the sites are proposed to have a general plan land use designation of RS3, which is a single family low density. This designation is consistent, um, excuse me, single family low density at a three dwelling unit per acre uh, designation. This is consistent uh, with the intent of the city's single family low density land use. Uh, it's also consistent with the adjacent city parcels immediately um, to the, uh, to the um, north of the site. So the second entitlement request before you tonight is for the zoning district boundary map that would change the city's uh, boundary limits to include these two parcels. Uh, the proposal is to pre-zone these parcels with a zoning designation of RS3 single family low density. That's consistent with the general plan designation that I was previously discussing. Um, also, again, consistent with the two immediately adjacent city parcels <clears throat> and as required by the zoning ordinance. The city's zoning ordinance has a specific chapter that is outlined specifically for criteria for annexation requests. Uh, this proposal is found to meet all of those requirements, contiguous to a city boundary and to city streets. Uh, the ordinance also requires that a fiscal impact analysis be prepared for any kind of annexation to determine any <clears throat> impact, fiscal impact that the annexation may have to the city. Conclusions of that report um, did formalize that no additional recurring service costs would occur to the city and that there would actually be, a, albeit a minor net fiscal benefit from a property tax receipt should the annexation be formalized. Um, the properties do not meet the city's minimum lot area based on slope, which is a criteria in the zoning ordinance. Um, however, the, neither parcel is requesting any further subdivision or the creation of new lots, and further that would be solidified through the recordation of a deed restriction that would be recorded against each parcel, which would prohibit any further subdivision in the future. Uh, and, and in summary, the um, property owners have been in discussion with um, city public works department staff and connection to the city sewer system has been determined to be feasible. Um, so with that, there is a recommendation that the council consider adoption of a resolution that would amend the general plan map to a land use designation of single family low density at three dwelling units per acre, as well as introduce an ordinance to amend the zoning district boundary map for a pre-zoning designation of RS3, single family um, low density, that would allow for the pre-zoning and annexation at 60 and 68 Loma Road. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, any questions? No. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Olbert. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, frankly driven by an email which we were given a copy of this evening. Um, and I just want to clarify something. The, the, the writer, the author, made mention, uh, made the comment that 80 Loma Road and 68 Loma Road have a common driveway. And um, I think the, the con gist of the question is the concern over whether or not making a decision about 68 requires a, uh, action on 80 or uh, impacts 80. Uh, without having, is, uh, 80 Loma Road, and we do have the property owners here, and perhaps they can um, specify that. But review of the information submitted for 68 Loma Road showed, um, did not show any kind of easement for access by 80 Loma Road. From your, just from your map, do you happen to know which one is 80? Oh, you don't. I don't. I'm sorry, I don't. Yeah. It might be this. This one? Or is it in the county here? Oh, it's, it's in the already. Okay. 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 Answer that question. Okay. Yes, it does. Um, Mr. Black's here. He's going to speak, actually. That's fine. Thank you. That was the same question I had, but it's already in St. Carlos. So. Other questions? I, I just had one um, because you mentioned about uh, the lots being undersized for our, our um, typical lot size. 
which is what, 5,000, I guess, or 6,000? It's based on slope, so the oh, steeper right. the lot, yeah. the bigger, or excuse me, the steeper the lot, the larger it has to be. These mm -hmm. parcels would have been required a two acre minimum based oh, okay. on their slope. All right, so my question then would be further development as, it, I, I take it there's two single family homes on, or one on each lot right now? Correct. So uh, they would be prohibited or allowed for additions and that sort of thing, adding to their square footage? They would be allowed to follow the regulations within the proposed pre-zoning of that single family low density designation. But okay. further subdivision and new lot creation would be prohibited. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. No other questions? No. Okay. Uh, it's a public hearing, so we do have a speaker on this, uh, Mr. Bob Black. This Bob Black. The Bob Black. The Bob Black. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mayor Gokot and members of the City Council. I'm Bob Black, member of, uh, resident of the City of San Carlos. I guess the first point on my, uh, that I have has already been addressed that, uh, that it is indeed contiguous. Uh, that is strange though that I went up and uh, examined the property and 80 and 68 do have a common driveway. And so I guess I ask the question is, is 68, is 80 in the city of yes. San Carlos? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, Bob. It is yeah. already. Okay, takes care of that. Uh, uh, staff report uh, considers only one alternative to the septic tank problem and seems primarily interested in supporting the request of the a non-resident of San Carlos. And I am a little bothered that uh, we are accepting uh, a property that is, does not meet our slope density ordinance. Uh, it, slope density ordinance seems to be one in which we uh, uh, honor more in the breach than in the substance of the ordinance. And uh, uh, this is another, another example of this. Um, um, it would, uh, I could, it, this could set a precedent for further requests for annexation of properties adjacent to San Carlos whose septic tanks are failing. Uh, where would you draw the line on this? Um, and unless San Carlos has a clear policy on such annexations, the city council can be accused of favoritism. Uh, in this case, the council is requested to grant a favor to a property owner uh, who is not within the city of San Carlos and who, because of the slope of the property, does not meet some of our conditions. Uh, I do request that you, as the city council, develop and establish a clear, relevant, annexation policy before deciding on this matter. It's something you might do tonight, but I think you must have a, a general policy that handles these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Black. Okay, I don't see any other speakers on this item. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I make motion. a motion to uh, close the public close hearing. Close the public hearing, very good. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Discussion on the item? Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, um, the one thought that occurred to me is, uh, and it's, it's not actually directly related to how I will uh, evaluate the particular proposal in front of us, but um, if it were possible to do so, I wouldn't mind if staff were to spend a little time reviewing whether or not there are other things like this likely to be occurring in that area. Um, um, uh, septic systems do fail. It almost sounds to me from the discussions we've had so far is that one should almost expect them to fail in, in this particular situation. Um, and so whether or not we have to develop a policy about that or not, it would be useful to know, I think, uh, what the, the uh, longer term outlook might be because perhaps there's something where, where there will eventually need to have to be some upgrades to support 
connecting additional people to the sewer system, and if so, I'd hate to have to lay it on the last person to ask us to, to uh, annex them. If, if I may, um, well, since I've been on the council such a long time, and I think even Bob was on the council, uh, we did exactly this, exactly what Mr. Black was asking for. Uh, I remember going through this and looking at annexation policies and reviewing them and uh, making some adjustments. But basically what it came down to, actually to speak to Mr. Black's concern about uh, showing favoritism, we, we, we dealt with that. that. That was part of the issue in a way was to um, is look at it in terms of public safety. And that is, that, therein lies the issue really on a lot of these annexation uh, requests that come forward is we felt like as a council at the time that if we're going to have properties in our influence area, so properties in Devonshire Canyon or up here on Loma Road and areas like that uh, that are on septic, if that septic fails, that becomes a public safety issue and it's in our sphere of influence. So that concerns us. And that's why we developed the policy that if you have a sewer, uh, a uh, septic system failure, uh, we're almost encouraging those property owners uh, to to look at annexation to the city if that's their desire. Of course, they don't have to. They can always uh, decide to reinstall a new septic and, and go that route. But oftentimes, a property owner will look at annexation as their solution to the to the septic problem. There are other reasons to annex. That's not the only one, uh, but I know that is something that we we uh, looked at. Now, to, to your point, though, I think, you know, we've got a pretty uh, new council in, in that sense of when people have come on and so forth. It probably wouldn't be a bad idea, I suppose, to have a you know, staff do a presentation at some time on this policy to update the council on this is what we went through and this is why these kind of things come to you and so forth without it being a night that we have an application, just an information item, if you will. Um, actually, if I may, um, I, I appreciate the historical background. It, it actually supports what I was thinking. I, my own personal view of this is it seemed like a neighborly thing to do when somebody's septic system um, is failing to try and help them out. I also understand the logic of, of public safety. I was uh, perhaps unclear. I was actually raising a somewhat different point, which is if that area uh, within our uh, uh, zone of influence has potential for a number of additional properties that might, say, in the next five or so years, need to be connected to the sewer system, um, if, it's, if that's a relatively easy thing to do without having to make infrastructure improvements, fine. I'm really raising the question of are, is there potential for have to make infrastructure improvements because I would hate to have to tell the last person to ask us, well, we can do it, but you have to spend $75,000 to improve the, the main line. Yeah, if I may here, uh, we can ask the county, but since those are all unincorporated properties, we don't have any data on the existing properties or, uh, or the condition of their septic tanks or how likely they are to fail, and a lot of it has to do with topography from what I understand. But we can ask the county if they have that type of information. But you know, one thing I want to be clear on here is that this is not doing a favor for homeowners. They pay their own way when they right. come in, yeah. and they extend the lateral when they come in. And depending on their proximity to the street and the size of the parcel and where their actual dwelling is located on the parcel, these things can be very, very expensive. Very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in the $75,000 range just for you alone. And so as each one comes in, which is, which is why we have the uh, contiguous requirement in the, in the association to the street and the system, because what's happening is they're extending the system up to their house and their property so that when the next one comes in, they would extend the system up to the next one and the next one and the next one. No, I see. So you're that's sort of, dealt, you're sort of you're resetting the concern. end point yeah. as it goes. All right. But it can be very expensive depending on your specific property and how long a lateral you have to build and all those things. So if I may, just one other quick, the, the, the contiguous requirement, does that mean, for example, if, if a property had a septic failure but it was one property further away, it was not connected to the city, we'd say, well, there may be a public health issue there, but sorry. In that instance, and we have done this in the past, we have allowed connections to the sewer system without allowing annexation. 
with the agreement that when the parcel, when and if the parcel became contiguous, that they would annex at that time. I see. We don't want to create islands outside the city. It, it, and the cost in that case is still borne by the property owner. The cost okay. is still borne, and they right. still pay sewer fees. Right. No, then uh, uh, you don't need to do any additional research for me. That answers my question. And the last comment, uh, just to add to this discussion a little bit, is uh, I believe, Mr. Save, this was, we addressed this also in the general plan annexation policy. That's correct. Right. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, just have one more question, Mr. Mayor. Um, since this area has been unincorporated coming into the city, are there any other costs like extending sidewalks, putting in uh, street lights, that sort of thing? There are no costs to the city associated with uh, infrastructure. Um, all the costs of infrastructure would be borne by the applicants. And I'm not completely familiar with this situation, but I don't think the streets up there are wide enough for sidewalks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. And there's no, there's virtually no cost either. Are there sidewalks there already? Okay. Typically, in, with these annexations, they're, they're not wide enough, the streets, to support sidewalks. But if they're already in place and they meet the city standards, then that's acceptable. Thank you. And the same would be true for public safety service, fire and police, because they're, again, they're in our zone of influence, so we already serve them. All right, uh, we're ready to. Mr. Mayor, I'd be uh, pleased to make a motion that the council approve resolution number 2013 dash. Number three. Three. Hmm. Three, resolution of the city of San Carlos City Council adopting a general plan map amendment for the properties located at 60 and 68 Loma Road. APN 051-472-020 and 051-472-021. To a land use designation of single family low density, parentheses, 3 DU per acre, close parentheses. Second. Roll call. Councilmember Clapper? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Mayor Grocott? Yes. I, I'm just curious at the three. Uh, uh, me too. <laughs> what else have we done? <laughs> Two items on the consent calendar. That's what I was looking. Okay. F and G. Um, F and G. Okay. Sorry, G and H. Mr. Mayor, I think we need a, another vote, don't we? Need just one more, Stephanie, or, or two more? Yeah, there's an ordinance. We need to one more for the ordinance. We have to introduce an ordinance. Or introduce an ordinance. So I'd like to make a motion to introduce ordinance number 1453. 1453, the ordinance of the City of San Carlos City Council adopting a zoning district boundary. Map amendment for the properties located at 60 and 68 Loma Road, APN 051472 dash 020 and 051-472-040 to allow for pre-zoning of the properties to RS-3 single family low density. Second. We've had a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Very good. Uh, roll call. Councilmember Clapper? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Mayor Grocott? Yes. Welcome to San Carlo. Is that it? Almost. <laughs> All right. Then we go to item 7B, uh, which is another public hearing. And uh, this is, do, do you want to introduce this? Uh, sure, Mr. Mayor. Um, this item is an appeal um, of the uh, denial of a business registration um, for Sunflower Massage a massage establishment at 1482 Laurel Street, San Carlos. Um, the, the appeal, uh, it's, it's an, it comes as an appeal under uh, Municipal Code Section 1.25. Um, the, the, uh, the appellant, um, the business owner, is, has uh, asked for a continuance uh, of this item. And they've requested a reinspection of their property, um, which will take place this week, as I understand it. So under our code, um, in order to continue this item, uh, the hearing has to be open tonight, and then it can be continued to a date certain to continue the uh, appeal. Um, and uh, I, I see that the applicant and her counsel are here to, to confirm the request for the um, continuance. But again, we need to open the, the public hearing, take any public testimony that might uh, be here tonight, and then after that, you can 
keep the hearing open and continue to the February 11th, 2013 date. Very good. Well, the hearing is open. So uh, do we have any speakers on this item? I don't have any speaker cards, so if you could fill one of these out afterwards, that'd be great. I think I did. Uh, oh, you did? Uh, oh, maybe I missed it. 7B. Oh, I'm sorry. You seven. did. There you go. Okay, uh, go ahead. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Carey. I'm an attorney. I represent Sunflower Massage. Um, what uh, Mr. Rubin said is absolutely correct. Uh, we have um, an inspection of both a fire inspection and a um, uh, inspection by the building department set for tomorrow. I anticipate that those matters will be completed uh, by the end of this week. In addition, we're requesting uh, that our opportunity to present evidence be continued in a sense until the next uh, uh, hearing of the City Council uh, on February 11th. And the reason for that is that I'd like to sit down and discuss with uh, the City staff and with the City Attorney the resolution of certain factual matters that are contradicted in our appeal. And uh, that's, I'd respectfully request your indulgence in that, in, in, in that matter so that we can put together uh, a presentation and it will be a, a far different presentation than uh, is in our present appeal in the sense that certain factual issues will be developed. Very good. Thank you. I know. And uh, would uh, Lee Yang also like to speak? or She would just also, she is here. Yeah, she filled out a card, here, so. And she'd like to request a continuance. I, I filled okay. out uh, the card for her. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Okay, it takes a motion to uh, continue the public hearing. Mr. Mayor, I move that we continue the public hearing on this matter until our until our February 11th, 2013 meeting. I'll second that. All right. Roll call. Councilmember Clapper. Yes. Councilmember Collins. Yes. Councilmember Grisilli. Yes. Councilmember Obert. Yes. Mayor Grocott. Yes. Okay, and that brings us to item C, which is uh, consideration of a recommendation of the Planning Commission to certify the EIR on San Carlos Transit Village, or SCTV, that threw me off. <laughs> now you know. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. At the December 10th City Council meeting, the City Council and public received presentations from a number of different experts who worked on the environmental impact report. And there are a number of these experts here this evening. Uh, if the Council needs clarification on any of the issues. Now that the Council has heard from and asked questions of the experts, the next step would be to conduct a public hearing and eventually consider a motion on whether or not to certify the final environmental impact report. The city may also consider giving project direction and the applicant direction on the proposed project as part, as part of the uh, improvements measures which would further guide the project if it moves into the second phase, which is the entitlement phase. Certification of the EIR is, um, is done by a resolution, and, and uh, I'll get to that in just a minute. But in terms of tonight's meeting, um, tonight, as, as I noted, you've heard from the experts. So the next step would be to conduct a public hearing, and then, as I noted, consideration of the, of the final document and the improvement measures. Um, certification of the EIR is done by a resolution which is a written statement adopted by the City Council. And as the Council's recommending body regarding CEQA, the Planning Commission has recommended adoption of the resolution, which includes findings and conclusions on the adequacy of the final environmental in, uh, document. This document is the City's document. Certification of the EIR is a statement that the document has adequately studied the potential environmental impacts of the project. Certification of the EIR also refers to the documents that constitutes the final environmental document. That would be uh, the draft EIR and in, in all the appendices in that document, 
the responses to comments document, the errata, which staff has prepared, and table S2, which is the mitigation measures uh, that have been corrected. Additional improvement measures that I, as I have mentioned, have been recommended by the Planning Commission. And uh, this is, again, for phase two, if the project goes forward into phase two, these are intended to be conditions of project approval for the project to be considered. And um, they're not intended to be sequent mitigations, however. The City Council can confirm or modify those improvement measures, and any guidance uh, on them would be helpful for the Planning Commission and the applicant as the project moves forward in the process if it does. May I interrupt you for just a sure. second there? Um, when, I just want to get a clarification. When you said the recommendations are not CEQA documents, uh, can you dig into that a little bit? What, what is meant by that? These, uh, these improvement measures um, were included outside of the, of the CEQA process. In CEQA, in the EIR, you have mitigation measures, which um, are in, in state code for uh, the California Environmental Quality Act. And those mitigation measures are supposed to reduce any environmental impacts to a level of insignificance. So that's the CEQA part. Those are the mitigation measures. You would be considering those. However, the, the Planning Commission felt that there were a number of issues that were um, important to their consideration of the EIR, but they were outside of the CEQA process. And they wanted, it, they, they felt like if this goes forward, then we want the applicant, we want the city council, we want the public to know that these are some issues we think is important moving forward. So it's really a separate document called improvement measures for, the fut for future consideration. And that's what is shown up here on the screen. They're included in your in your packet. So those would be taken up when we when the project goes through entitlement. That's right. Okay. I'm sorry. I apologize. Should have been listening. Are you saying we're not going to be talking about these tonight? We'll do it at entitlement. You can talk about these. That is. Um, I understood that they, I understood that the, it carries through. That's why I was confused. Yes. Sure. That you can talk about them tonight. You can add to them. You can modify them. Um, and it's guidance for the future. Okay. So these improvement measures are just guidance for phase two. Okay. So, well, okay, I apologize. So if, if there's no comment on any of these, are they etched in stone if we vote no. for the EIR tonight? No, um, because nothing's been approved. So they're, okay. they're still... It's so there's another like, bite of the apple could, could be taken? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. That, that you, what you're driving at is what I was driving at is that I wanted to understand that since they're separate from CEQA, right. they, they would move forward as recommendations, but as you, to use your term, they're not etched in stone because they will simply be taken up in the next phase. The next phase. Okay, yes. right. fine. Thank That's you. Right. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Fay. Thank you. Thanks. No problem. So in uh, closing, if the City Council reaches the point in this meeting where it's ready to consider a motion, staff will be prepared to present the motion, this language on the screen. And um, the City Council could consider a motion expressing your interest, interest in changes to the project or incorporation of additional measures, those improvement measures, as recommended by the, the Planning Commission. So as you can do the secret document and you can refer back to these improvement measures. So uh, this motion is represented in the slide and any new specific um, interests of the Council could be added to this motion. And, and if you're ready this evening, we'll go back and we'll provide you with this language up on the screen. Again, uh, that concludes the staff report. Staff is available to answer any questions, as are the consultants that were, or their representatives that were here at the last meeting. And that concludes the staff report. Questions for staff? No. You, you, um, Mr. Robert? Just a, a point of clarification in terms of process. Um, since at the, our previous meeting, there were a number of questions that I know I at least didn't ask. When is the appropriate time for me to be asking them of staff and the presenters? I hadn't thought about that. Uh, I did want to get through all the public comment tonight, so um, I'm inclined to go to that first and then come back to, to very in-depth questions. Do you have a few that are maybe 
more general. I have one that's kind of general to the process, I think. But um, I didn't really structure mine that way. There's okay. some are general and yeah. some are not, so I'm happy to wait till after the public comment. Okay. Um, and uh, there is one that I do have, and um, I just want to know how to how to address it, how to deal with it, um, and perhaps according to your answer, not at all. But if you remember on Wheeler Plaza, I voted no on the environmental impact report. And my reason was because it, it ignored the traffic impacts we have already on Holly Street, except to say, well, we'll put money aside in a fund to mitigate traffic in the future. And my reasoning for voting against it was uh, we're only going to have a uh, further impacted traffic issue in the future and yet to, to what we already have and what we already have is in my estimation an unacceptable condition so what's the point of putting money aside and saying we're going to deal with this in the future uh, and and sort of kick the can down the road um, and the other thing I heard on that project was we're not required with the EIR to really cons consider Holly Street, which it didn't. It, it just looked at intersections in and around the downtown and traffic around the project. And I asked the question, how far do we throw the net? And, and again, the answer I got was, we're not required to go that far. So my question now is, even though we're not required to go that far, could we make, if, if we wanted to as a council, could we make a decision we want to go that far? Or is that not it, would that be disallowed somehow by, would that be an infringement of property rights or whatever? I believe that uh, Holly Street traffic was considered as part of this EIR traffic study. And what I would suggest is that um, if you have specific concerns about Holly Street traffic and intersections around there, that uh, you ask that question of the transportation engineer. But I, and I can go into more detail with regard to your discussion. Oh, so, but if I answered your question, then... Yeah, you did. Yeah. So when we get Good. to yeah. asking staff... Through the so mayor, we can do that. if I may just add sure. to the, Mr. Seve's comments, there's a nexus issue, though. You can't just extend the traffic study to the entire city. You're well, I'm not to, trying to. Right, you're going to yeah, have to have a nexus I, I, to the I'm project. looking at Holly itself, not, not the entire city, but just Holly. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, tonight, we did want to have the public hearing um, and I just want folks to know um, running this meeting that we, I've only got a few speaker cards quite frankly so it's not that many um, and I know there was one person in particular that had a uh, I think a PowerPoint presentation that they wanted to, to give to us um, so I'm saying this to the council my feeling on this is we already spent one meeting uh, where we started at 5 and we didn't get out of here till 1130 where we heard the city staff and the applicant so I'm inclined to be a little bit liberal most of these comment cards are from the uh, in fact I think they're all from well maybe one or two or not but uh, they're from the uh, greater east side community which does act somewhat as an organization so I'm inclined to be a little bit liberal with the time and let them present uh, what their issues are given how much time we already spent with with the applicant and if that's fine by council I don't want this meeting running till you know two in the morning by any means but again we only have five speaker cards maybe it looks like six is that fine with council I agree with that okay. Mr. Mayor I have no, no objection to giving them discretion understood okay all right well, that's the, um, that's the way we're going to do it then. Uh, I'll be liberal with you on your comments. Uh, if you're repeating what somebody else said, I'm going to ask you to uh, close it up, and, uh, and we'll go with that. And, and I, like I said, the, the fellow that has the PowerPoint, since he went to all the trouble to put that together, I want to give him a chance to uh, show it to us. Plus, it'll for me, and I think the rest of the council members, it'll answer a lot of questions since this is a lot of material to dig into, and you guys obviously dug into it. All right. Um, should we do? Do you intend to start first? I am the the guy with the PowerPoint. So yeah, I know that. But you guys have called you yet? I, yeah, we have a lot of speakers. I'm just. But if you, you know, you guys know what you're doing with the East Side group. If that's fine. If you want to.
present first, that's fine. Um, I do have a, before we do that, I tell you what, um, there's one speaker card that's from a different organization, uh, the Sierra Club, and that's Bonnie, so uh, I want to give her a chance to come up first and, and speak. And uh, why don't we go with David Crabb next, because he's also not with the East Side, and then we can get the rest after that, unless David doesn't want to do that. Very good, okay. That'll be fine. All right. Bonnie. Bonnie Hello McClure, again. San Carlos resident, but I'm speaking for the Sierra Club, Sustainable Land Use Committee, and the, and the Loma Prieta chapter. Uh, we urge the City Council to certify the final environmental import, impact report uh, for San Carlos Transit Village, but we also urge you as well to approve the table of improvement measures for the entitlement stage for this project. Uh, we, as you know, uh, don't go around endorsing things without knowing what the project's going to look like. But we do, at this stage, we urge you to proce proceed and get it on the road. Um, we have a letter that we sent you on December 5th that outlines a lot of improvements we'd like to see when it comes to the project uh, stage. Uh, the improvement measures have included some of our, but we have others. And just briefly, two things that are quite important, and one is that the 15% below market rate requirement for the units be reinstated because they were promised two years ago when this project came before uh, in the uh, preliminary EIR. And uh, in the entitlement stage, we feel it's very important because that's an ideal place for low-cost housing and moderate housing. And it's transit-oriented. These people usually have maybe one car, not three. And they can take transit. And that's, that's a very logical place. And if you go with an end Luffy charging the developer 15, you know, what it would equal building 15 units someplace else or 40 units someplace else, you may never spend that money because you may not have the land to build it on. And the Cherry Street uh, land that you're anticipating perhaps buying, uh, you've got some of the Wheeler Plaza BMR units already spoken for for that. So there wouldn't be enough space there. So uh, I really urge you to, to consider requiring 15% of the units be for be, uh, below moderate, uh, you know, real low cost, moderate housing. There's a scale that's on the city housing element that you should be following. And then the other thing is that uh, one of the uh, improvements we asked for was unbundled parking. Again, because if you sell an apartment, I mean, rent an apartment uh, for X amount of dollars, and it includes a parking space, and you don't have a car, that's not really fair. And some guy may have two cars. And so if you just rent the living space and then charge for the parking space separate, it makes a lot more sense, particularly at this location where we hope the people be, will be using transit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Crabb wanted to wait. And where's Dimitri? There he is. Let's see. Here, let's go that way. See if I can find the. Uh... <coughs> so um, this has been a, a, a very long process. Introduce yourself, please. Hi, it's Dimitri Vandellos. I'm a communications uh, director um, and South of Holly rep for the uh, Greater East San Carlos Neighborhood Association. And uh, this this project and our involvement with it has uh, has been a, a pretty long journey. And uh, one point that I'd like to make is uh, 
um, uh, you know, we, we've been at this for a long time. And we know the, these is issues inside and out. And uh, we've tried very hard uh, to create a dialogue uh, with the developer and with Samtrans over the years. And um, it's, it's been tough. It's been a tough road. It's been tough sledding. Uh, can you hear me again? Oh, really? I've, got, I've got some people in the audience doing this. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, and one point I want to make is, um, you know, the city made a, a, a good effort at the last meeting to send out uh, letters to the community, and we had a, a, a large turnout. Unfortunately, no one was able to, to, to talk, and uh, we've all been so busy, we didn't try to, to, to get folks to show up to this meeting. So uh, the, the one thing I'd, I'd ask the city council to consider is that uh, the lack of a, a sea of, of red shirts here isn't due to uh, a lack of involvement or commitment on the part of the community. It's just that it's a game of attrition. It's very hard for mm -hmm. people to come meeting after meeting after meeting. This is maybe our eighth or tenth or twelfth meeting <laughs> that, 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 that we've attended, and we've had uh, a quite, uh, quite a large number of uh, residents show. Uh, so let's see. How do I just get this this guy to move? The map. I'm clicking on it. It's making a. Oh, okay, great. So um, at the at the previous uh, presentation, uh, I was taking notes uh, in, in real time. I don't want to spend too too much uh, too much effort here. Um, that uh, you know the the right of way. Uh, the Caltrain and Samtrans owns is is something that that they they own in trust for the for the people for the county. Um, so they are uh, developing uh, quite a few uh, uh, properties. Uh, and in my uh, in my written feedback to to the to the council, uh, I believe I, I listed a number of them. Uh, the Samtrans representative was claiming that there are only two, but there's significantly more um, of these developments along the the rail corridor. Um, I, I bring that up because this is a this is a, you know a, 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 a regional effort that uh, that the Sam Trans is, is putting together to develop their properties. Um, so I'm not going to I'm not, not going to spend too much time in in the six and a half hours. A couple of things popped in my mind uh, when you when when they showed uh, the rep visual representations. The cars weren't to scale with the buildings, so the cars. Would have been, uh, you know, humongous cars next to these smaller buildings. You have to look at those, at the diagrams that are showed by the artist representations, with a little bit of a grain of salt, as in some of the uh, feedback that the that the experts were providing. I, I just bring that up because it's a subtle thing, it's a subconscious thing that you may not notice, and you might think that the scale of these buildings isn't that big, uh, but 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 it's it's pretty big. Uh, so let's just keep moving here. Um, a couple of other quick questions. Um, you know, the study did not include impacts of the multimodal station. We, it, when when uh, um, when the request for proposals came out, this the the multimodal station and the transit village were all part of one big package, and now they've been split into two separate uh, projects. And you can't you can't really uh, analyze the impacts to San Carlos and to our our community. In particular, without looking at those those projects in conjunction, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit further. Um, a, a couple of other real quick things is uh, I, I noticed that there was no discussion of improvements uh, at Holly and El Camino, and that's where four out of the six, two thirds, if not more, of the residential uh, uh, units are going to be uh, on the north side of Holly Street. So. So crossing uh, at, at El Camino and Holly for these uh, for these folks who are supposedly going to be taking the train instead of driving, um, I, I think it's critical for us to consider improvements to that intersection because um, that's I don't know if anyone's ever tried to cross the street there. It's 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 quite difficult and dangerous. Uh, so you know, in, in our view, the EIR. Uh, just ignored uh, uh, our neighborhood and community impacts, old county road impacts, our scenic views, environmental hazards, traffic and parking from the project in the multimodal station, the noise from the train operations and the bounce back from the buildings. We heard lots of comments that um, 
uh, uh, the, the, the sound expert was saying, well, there's never been a 2 dB increase in, in noise bounce back. Uh, the, the, what was missing from that is uh, sound is, 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 a, is, a, is a logarithmic curve. And as, as you go up, the numbers increase exponentially. So uh, a, a 2 dB increase from 3 to 5 is barely perceptible to the ear. Whereas when you get into the 80s and 90s, it's very, very significant. And if you look at a chart, you'll see it's, it's stuff like that. Think about the Richter scale. An 8.0 earthquake is very different than a 9. Or an, an 8.5 is very different from an 8.7. So as, you go, as those numbers get higher, the small, small increments are, are way greater. And uh, the noise uh, at the station uh, was in the 80s, 80 dB. So the difference between 80 and 82, or 82 and 84, is a heck of a lot more than 40 to 42, or 40 to 50 even. Um, the electrification and high-speed rail, which, which we consider foreseeable projects, uh, were really pretty much uh, ignored. There was some discussion about the four-track system. Uh, I went to the uh, the recent uh, Caltrain meeting where they talked about the blended the blended study, and a couple of things that I think are really important to consider in thinking about this project are that three out of the five options for passing tracks uh, passing tracks could con uh, conceivably be four track paired systems or three track non paired systems. Three out of, out of the five all went through San Carlos. So we're talking about a 60%. The odds are 60% uh, that if, if it, the, the blended system uh, uh, needs additional, if, if HSR is going to need more than two, two trains per hour, the odds are 60% that uh, it's going to come through our community. So that, that's something to consider. It's, 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 uh, you know, I, I just want to make sure our eyes are open uh, as a community regarding that. Uh, and uh, at that study, they, they mentioned that uh, there were two other options, one more on the south uh, uh, side of the, of the peninsula and, and on the north, northern section. Uh, but they said that the middle options were the ones that had better performance. Uh, so, because, you know, as you're trying to get tra trains to pass, it's, it's easier somehow when it's more in the middle of, of the span. So, you know, I think in considering this project, uh, and considering the cumulative impacts, uh, we need to have our eyes wide open regarding the fact that uh, our berm, which we went through considerable expense and inconvenience to have constructed, uh, may be forced to come down. And there, there's, there's no way we can, we can tell. Uh, if that berm comes down and the, and the project is built, uh, we're, we're going to have some pretty tough issues. It's going to be very difficult to keep Old County Road open if not impossible. Um, and uh, the impacts to the, to the community are going to be great. So I just, I just ask that the council consider uh, asking, uh, asking those questions and uh, trying to get as much clarity as possible. We can't predict the future, so we don't really know. But um, in, in our discussions uh, with Samtrans, uh, they, they have taken the tack that, oh, that's way off in the future and, you know, it'll never happen. At this meeting, uh, you know, they have a MOU between the Joint Powers Board and the High Speed Rail Authority where they're discussing that. Uh, they have, uh, they're talking about er exploring ways to accelerate early investment uh, project delivery and to clear the early investment in blended system improvements into one environmental document. So they're, so they're making plans for, uh, for HSR while sort of denying that it's really happening. And, and they have to. I mean, you know, it's... I, I, I can't predict the future. I don't know if we're going to have an HSR system, uh, but it's 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 uh, <laughs> it's something that, that must be considered. Um, one thing in the EIR uh, that I do take some exception to, in in the characterization that uh, city staff has, has presented, is the the principles of the East Side Specific Plan and the San Carlos General Plan and Resolution 2003-79 we're not used as metrics to measure impacts, community impacts. So, and, and, and I feel that that's a, a, a pretty big omission. That, that was something that could have been used as a guideline to say, hey, yeah, this fits within the community, this project fits within the community, uh, or it doesn't. 
Um, and and I, I do ask the council to, uh, to think about what our general plans, uh, what, what our plans for the city are and whether or not uh, due diligence was done in, in uh, using, uh, in, 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 in the arguments that, uh, that were made in the EIR stating that uh, there were no significant impacts. Uh, let's move on. So speaking, speaking of that, these were all um, uh, drawings that, that, uh, that were taken of the, of the project. And this is the project that is being considered. Um, and then you, you can kind of see the scale here of a person uh, several years ago at, at the first planning commission meeting by, by the draft EIR, I made a joke that uh, that person is, will be, would be the last person uh, living in the San, San Carlos neighborhood um, when, once the buildings are built. Uh, but you can get a, you can just basically get a feel for the scale of the buildings, the fact that this area is a bit higher than, than where our neighborhood is, and again, without really knowing what's going to happen with this berm, um, Sam Trans has stated that there is room, technically room. They have never talked about staging, but they but they've talked about physical room. That there were early studies that you know we, they could do four tracks. Um, but that's going to push the trains much closer to these buildings, and I, I you know, I'm, I'm not going to doubt the the, the veracity of of of, of, uh, of those statements. But uh, what's missing there is uh, wh where do you put a shoe fly track if you need it if you if you need to keep the train running? Um, uh, where where is construction uh, going to occur for a HSR if this berm needs to come down, or electrification? So we're going to have impacts, and part of those impacts. Are, are due to uh, to the project itself. Whoa. Uh, let's let's block. Oh, interesting. <laughs> it's trying to go to, to our to our website. So uh, if if you look at the dotted line there, uh, that's the height of the uh, train platform, and you can see, uh, you know, so a train's going to be up here, and the the sound guy. Uh, was talking about how there's really no impact unless one wall is higher than the other. And what, what I asked the city council to consider here is, is you can see that the height of the train is significantly lower than the, the, these buildings. And, and that noise, even though it may only be 2 dB, although the studies weren't, weren't made, um, is, is uh, there, there will be an impact. It's, it, it's hard to, to say that there won't be an impact. But the point I'm making is, is when you look at those drawings that, that were presented by the, by the consultants, um, they weren't showing this, right? And this is, this is kind of a stark. Uh, I'm, I, I didn't make these up. These were, these were from, the, uh, from their plans. Uh, so this is the eastern elevation. Ah, sorry. Here we go again. Uh, this is the southernmost uh, retail building. Uh, this is where the, uh, uh, the platform is currently. And you can see that, again, it's significantly higher. This, these are only, this is a currently planned as a three-story building. Um, but you can see that uh, uh, actually the, the height of these buildings is, is just about as high as the uh, residential buildings. So uh, we, we have to be careful about three stories versus four stories and actually think about the height. Um, uh, I, I tend to measure uh, the height of the building from the top of the, the roof, but that's just me because I'm a simple person. Uh, uh, the, uh, the plans are, actually show the roof midpoint, so there's some discrepancies. I, I believe, believe the roof midpoint uh, uh, amongst, for many of the buildings are, are in the high 40s, um, and so there's some dis there's, there have been some discrepancies uh, in terms of uh, um, who says how high the buildings are. Uh, these are the views that we have. I'm just going to run through these really quickly. These are the views that, are not, that uh, theoretically are not being impacted at all by the 50-foot buildings. Uh, one thing that never was mentioned uh, as, as, a, as a public area here, the, the station itself, the, the buildings are going to knock out all these views as well, uh, which I think is a bummer. Um, they talked about the shadow studies. Uh, I, I, you know, I was kind of encouraged by the, the shadow study. And, and sort of amazed because some of those trees, when they did the simulation, I've never seen a tree provide as much shade as as, as that study did. Um, but uh, if, if you you know, I'm not sure that the, 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 
if you guys feel that due diligence was done in the shadow uh, studies, then, then that's great. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the multimodal station impacts. This is very worrisome to me because it, there's a lot of uh, discussion about the project and the folks that are living there, but there has been no discussion about the fact that the multimodal station in the parking lot is being moved significantly further south from the train platform itself. And uh, the issue there is that um, uh, we're very concerned about how our, uh, how our neighborhood is going to be impacted. Uh, so uh, in, in my early calculations, we were actually getting a reduction in parking spaces by over 20 percent. Um, the hope is that more people will be riding uh, this new electrified system, so that's worrisome. Uh, school kids taking the bus, uh, my daughter uh, takes the bus and gets let off and, you know, right, right by the underpass so she can walk straight, straight home. I'm concerned about the, the, uh, 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 the new station uh, letting kids off in different areas and, and, and walking along there. So to, to, make, to illustrate the point is uh, in our neighborhood south of Holly Street, midway on the first block between uh, Old County Road and um, uh, I'm forgetting what that next street is, Bayport. Uh, it's just a tenth of a mile from uh, any of the streets. It's actually shorter in, in many of the locations. It's one tenth of a mile from our neighborhood in the first block uh, to the platform. And if you go to the second block of our neighborhood, which is from Bayport all the way down to Industrial, it's two tenths of a mile. The closest spots in the new lot, the closest spots, the vast majority of those, of those spots in the new lot are going to be significantly further, but the closest, and there are just a few, are, uh, uh, again, two tenths uh, from the platform. So someone could park at, um, on, on my block all the way at industrial and be closer to the platform than the new parking lot. That's, that's a concern. Uh, the reason that's a concern is folks can get free parking in our neighborhood. Um, and I'd like to see Samtrans bring something to the table and offer uh, free parking to commuters in this, you know, if, if this project gets approved. Um, I think that would be beneficial to the city to have free parking in that lot. And it, and it could incentivize folks to actually use the uh, parking lot for its intended purpose. Uh, you'll see that the Transit Village Apartments are about a third of a mile. Uh, that's about as far as Town Restaurant is to the platform, so, so folks can get an idea. Uh, the Olive Street and Caltrain parking lot to the platform, that's the middle of the new lot, is a little over a third of a mile. City Hall to the platform, where we are now, is the same distance. Uh, for me, it's nothing. That's a trivial walk, um, but for, for uh, a commuter or someone who's just spent 20 minutes driving from the hills down and then has to walk a third of a mile, that may cause them to just decide not to, to take public transit, which is not what we want. Um, uh, the front doors of the library to the platform, uh, 0.42, and the uh, further, furthermost parking uh, is, is the same distance, the Arroyo Street and Caltrain parking lot. Those are measurements I did on, in Google Maps uh, years ago. Uh, here are the traffic and driveways. Now, I heard, uh, and, and one, one of the city council members made it a very astute uh, um, uh, 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 remark regarding uh, how can traffic be reduced by 20%. I forget who it was, but um, it it's boggles the mind that we'll have uh, 280 uh, uh, apartment buildings plus all of this new um, uh, 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 commercial stuff and, and the parking will somehow be magically reduced 20 percent. Um, but at that, that point was made clear it's, it's theoretically is less if it's a well-designed transit-oriented development. Uh, but you can see there's a heck of a lot of driveways. Each of these lines here are driveways. And uh, here's San Carlos Avenue. We're going to have people hitting, you know, lefts going straight, doing new turns. Two driveways on one side of, of San Carlos, two driveways on the other side by Cherry. Another two driveways north of Holly Street, U-turns, right turns, left turns, go, cutting across Holly Street. There was no discussion of improving this critical um, crossing, given that most of the residents are going to be up here. 
and they're going to have to walk across here and get all the way to the train station. So I, 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 I ask uh, the, the, that we consider that, uh, that we look at ways of this project should clearly be figuring out how to improve this intersection. Uh, if if a anyone has not tried to, to walk across there, uh, um, give it a shot. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not fun. Uh, w w we've been very consistent uh, uh, from the beginning in, in trying to figure out ways to make this project something that, that would work for uh, San Carlos as a whole, for our community. And uh, for a really, really long time, uh, is, uh, and, and, and Ben Fuller stated this many years ago, is how do you develop the area in a way that's a win on both sides? Uh, back in 2006, it's very different, say, than how the uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation has done things. They've come to us and listened to our concerns. There's been no outreach from Santrans in the last two to three years. That's back in 2006. Uh, that has changed very recently, and there have been discussions. Um, but we're left with a, a plan that's uh, the onus of, of making the improvements really lies with uh, the Planning Commission and City Council because we didn't have a good back and forth. We didn't have uh, a, a spirit of, of cooperation and dialogue in trying to figure out how to make this a project that works for the community. Um, so it's, it's a rush job to try to, try to get there. Uh, I mentioned electrification and HSR. You can, you can read those bullet points. Um, in terms of mitigations, you know, everything is mitigated by reducing the size and scope of the project. Uh, we're deeply concerned about Old County Road. Um, I'm not going to get into those details. They're pretty obvious. Uh, we'd like to see shuttles moved to the new multimodal station if we're making improvements and we're saying, hey, this is a great, uh, great thing, this new multimodal station. Uh, we'd like the shuttles from the east side moved there since uh, traffic is going to be so much better and reduced magically. Uh, we, you know, we've talked about increasing the landscaping and trees, reducing the height of the buildings. These are some ideas for mitigations that we have uh, been actually amazingly consistent over the years. Uh, we'd like to make sure that the electrification project uh, that, that there is some review so we understand what the impacts to landscaping and, and, and what the impacts to, to uh, our visual impacts are uh, as regards the electrification system. There are going to be these big transformers uh, to, to power these uh, electrified trains. There are going to be catenary lines uh, and there, uh, I'd like to make sure that we understand what that system is going to look like. And, um, you know, I'd like to see Samtrans come, come to the uh, bring something to the community uh, and uh, you know one one idea is uh, to uh, to make free parking for uh, commuters using the lot uh, I mentioned the uh, crosswalk improvements noise reduction measures for the train a quiet zone these are things that we've we've talked about for years and years and years uh, park funds for Loreola park expansion uh, getting uh, the developer and Sam trans to pitch in uh, Samtrans, I was, uh, you know, a little incredulous that uh, the Samtrans representative uh, was, you know, kind of poo-pooing the idea of a million bucks a year um, that they were making, uh, and then you multiply that by the number of projects that they're considering. This is a, uh, you know, a fairly significant uh, uh, income stream for them. Uh, let's keep going. Um, I don't want to get too technical and wonky about the sound study measurements, but uh, in my draft EIR feedback and in my final EIR feedback, I did ask for specific measurements of trains entering and exiting the platform, um, and uh, that just wasn't done. And the, uh, the rationale for that was it's not going to be more than a 3 dB increase. Of course, that ignored the logarithmic curve, and we're already over allowable limits. Um, uh, my draft EIR feedback, uh, there was, uh, they basically said, well, we don't need to consider that because it, it's HSR, in, um, it, it's an HSR study, but the study actually was the uh, Federal Transportation Authority and, and on its cover was a picture of Caltrain. Um, so there, there, there were, you know, there's some issues with, the, with these studies. Uh, no train horn noise was measured, um, that, that was worrisome. Uh, the impacts on the mobile station, 
And um, as I mentioned earlier, it's this lack of consistency regarding the general plan guidelines and not referencing them in the EIR. Uh, the RFP document clearly states the project is supposed to take into consideration the land use policies and design guidelines from the city. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about impartiality of the city staff. Um, this, this project is part of uh, the Grand Boulevard Initiative. And um, I feel that uh, I'm concerned that there's, there's uh, more advoc advocacy for the project than is, uh, than is being publicly stated. Uh, and uh, it's really up to um, this process from the Planning Commission and City Council uh, to look, look past uh, what we consider emissions in the EAR documents. And uh, if, if, if you decide to approve the EIR uh, to, uh, in, in the uh, entitlements phase, to, to really look at these issues and, and consider community impacts, because the EIR did not. And that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Dimitri. Mr. Mayor, to the chair. Yes. is it possible to get a, a, a copy of this? You, you have it here. And uh, I, I don't have it anywhere, but oh, I, I'll, I'll be happy to send it. I, not on your dime, if you maybe can somehow, you have it? And we can, we have it. I'm sorry, okay. Thank you to me. Yeah, yeah no, no problem. I'm happy to send it or oh, a, any other info. We'll and, and also, I'm, I'm hoping you guys did read the, uh, the, the written feedback, because it, it did provide a context for what's been going on for the past few years. So thank you. So how, how do I quit this? Yeah, how do I exit this? Escape from? Oh, I see. There we go. Ah. Okay, our next speaker uh, is Ben Fuller. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for hearing our thoughts. Uh, as mentioned, unfortunately, uh, we had a, all the paid, highly incentivized consultants um, had to earn their check at the last meeting. And that was when we were able to generate the, the people. And uh, it is a war of attrition, as Dimitri said. And with that said, I still have some hope um, because I feel like we have very thoughtful council members and planning commissioners who have been listening, and we appreciate it, uh, well informed and, uh, and, and really asking good questions. So I'm going to keep it a little short, and I'm going to try to put this in context. Um, what has been requested is 281 units on the San Carlos Transit Village appointed land uh, that's coming from Sam Transit and Joint Powers Board. And it's a very complicated story about whose land it is and whether it, there should be railroad tracks running there in the future and whether we should save this land for right away or not. Um, with that said, you know, progress must continue and something probably is going to get built there. And right now we're looking at this project. And we'll put it in the context of what exists now in San Carlos history. So I know that uh, Ron, for example, played baseball. And I know that uh, Mark um, often spent time over in, in Greater East San Carlos as a as a younger man, and, and many of you as well have been over there quite a bit. And in case you didn't know, there's 500 homes in Greater East San Carlos, actually maybe 502. And uh, whether that includes the apartments um, at the end of Old County Road next to Bacon, I'm not sure. But I know that there's 491 standing homes. And uh, we're talking now about 281 units. So uh, what I want to try to make sure is that the city council considers, you know, each home is probably worth half a million bucks, maybe six or seven hundred thousand bucks. And if you add 500 together, that's 350 million bucks worth of homes, you know, conservatively. It's a lot. It's a, there's a lot of homes already there. And now we have this structure coming in. And we've seen through what Dimitri represented that a lot of things are going to be impacted. You've got Old County Road. You've got views. You've got the noise issue. You've got the parking issue. And you've got um, a much larger sort of regional issue. I guess we could call it the Grand Boulevard Initiative. We all know that this is sort of the linchpin. If this gets built, 
you guys are essentially starting a, a cascade, a domino effect of these, what they call stack and pack apartments, all up and down El, Cam El Camino. You guys are the sort of like, you guys kick off the stack and pack uh, parade, okay? And so really the question is, what this building is gonna, what kind of impact is this building gonna have on the future of all of El Camino? Now, there's a couple ways to look at that. One way to look at it is that, let's build something that fits this neighborhood and maybe that'll then happen in the nine other places where, even though Mark Simon wasn't willing to admit it, that million bucks a year sort of amalgamates, you get a million bucks a year from nine different parcels, nine million bucks a year that helps us run our, our train. And we, we do wanna find ways to run the train and we think that you know, they're being creative and trying to generate some revenue. What we're concerned about is the scale at which they're doing this. And so, really our major issue, and, and it comes down to a document that you're gonna be looking at tonight, the final environmental impact report. And the finding in that final environmental impact report, I'll repeat, is that there are no significant adverse impacts of this project. This project is, it's basically not gonna impact anything is what our illustrious uh, paid consultants uh, with the, the sort of blessing of the city staff confirmed. This, this building is just gonna not have any impact and it's gonna be great and no one's gonna be impacted. That was the finding. Now, what happened was a really weird thing and I think, Mark, you were there, you saw this. The Planning Commission actually just punted. They, they spent a whole bunch of time massaging and nuancing the language around what they were going to approve for the final environmental impact board. Well, we're not really saying that we agree with the findings, right, Herr Lawyer? And then, then uh, Greg had to say, no, 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 you're not saying that you agree with the exact language. You're just agreeing that this thing can now go to the city council, but you're not saying you agree with the findings of the final environmental impact report. Because you're saying, well, if we did, we wouldn't agree with it. And so now you guys are in the same situation. This has been punted further and further down the road. And we could have been talking with Sam Trans and, and uh, Legacy for all these years, but they didn't really want to work with us until now. And we are starting to make progress. I'm not going to lie. It's not like a complete disaster. But the point is, this thing is still too big. And there are significant adverse impacts. Yet for some reason, and Al had to do it again. You heard. I mean, Matt, you brought up the point. Well, wait a second, Do, are these part of the CEQA process or not? And it's all been done very carefully. They don't want there to be significant adverse impacts in the CEQA process because that then means you gotta mitigate and they don't wanna be required to mitigate. And so they're pushing everything outside of the CEQA process is essentially turning five city council members into grand experts about how to mitigate this thing. Now you guys have the full responsibility of mitigation because nobody else wanted to do it. The Planning Commission, they did all these mitigations outside of CEQA because again, no one wants to admit the massive, massive adverse impact of the project as it currently stands. So we know you guys are really thoughtful. I've spoken with each of you. I've been very impressed with your knowledge on this issue. What we're really now asking for, because no one else is willing to do it, is it looks like it's up to you guys to try to mitigate however the impacts are seen, whether they're significantly adverse, whether they're outside of the process to mitigate these impacts. We really appreciate you guys uh, spending your time for all these years now on this project and it's up to you. Thank you. Thank you. Tim uh, Hilborn. Tim Hilborn, resident of San Carlos. Um, thank you, City Council, Mayor Grocott, for uh, hearing us tonight. Um, I only have one page, so, uh, and I was the guy that wrote SCTV. Didn't mean to uh, <laughs> fool you there. So, um, I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next time I'll write it out. I'm a school teacher, so I should do that, but uh, i lead by example. Um, before I go into the page and, and, and basically, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm gonna talk about, I, I do wanna echo, the sentiments of both Ben and Dimitri without uh, going into it ad nauseum. But, um, you know, there was a notice sent out about a public hearing. And uh, you saw the people that were here 
at the last public hearing, none of them got to speak, um, and there was no other notice sent out. So um, I would ask that you take that into consideration. There are a lot of people that aren't here um, that that really you know did want to speak, and uh, it is a matter of attrition, unfortunately, and um, everybody's busy. So. Um, if you would take that into consideration. Uh, tonight, what I w would like to go over, uh, basically, um, I want to address the final EIR master response number two, which uh, has to do with uh, visual quality. Um, it, it kind of uh, 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 skips over into density as well. Um, and one thing I just I want us to understand here because I've I've heard people kind of asking questions. Well, you know, uh, these land use policies can they be separate from CEQA? Are they with CEQA? Um, it, it, if you look at the law, um, even under CEQA, the the city has to follow the guidelines, and CEQA has to follow whatever city guidelines there are as well. For example, we have land use policies, we have general plans, those kinds of things. And um, it, it's really important that, that those are followed in the final EIR. And you as a city council have the power to do that. So I just, I, I want to make that clear. Um, so anyways, going into the CEQA uh, significant thresholds, one thing they talk about in the final master response, um, it says this section thus describes the consistency of the proposed project with the policies of the general plan, the San Carlos Municipal Co uh, Code, Title 18 Zoning, Resolution 2003-79, and the city's downtown urban design guidelines adopted for the purpose of avoiding or mitigating significant environmental impacts. The decision-making body of the jurisdiction will ultimately determine the proposed project consistency with the entire general plan and other city planning goals. We need to understand that that is written underneath CEQA. That was in the final EIR. So it's very important to understand that. Now, you could do that in the entitlement process, but that's not really the place to do that. The final EIR is really looking at the true impacts of what this is. I want to um, just look at policy, uh, land use policy 8-11. It says, to discourage abrupt changes in the building scale, a gradual transition between low-rise to mid-rise buildings should be achieved by using low-rise buildings at the edge of the project site. Consider the relationship of the buildings to the street, to one another, and to adjacent structures and land uses, especially single-family residential. You saw some of the images that Dimitri had up there. <clears throat> this FEIR, the final EIR, says that there is a less than significant impact. And we just absolutely don't agree with that. And, and this is straight from the land use policy from the city. So we really need to take that into consideration and the effect that it has. Um, the revised massing alternative, which the master um, response always goes back to, the revised massing alternative in the final EIR. Um, it reduces the massing on the eastern facade of the buildings facing Old County Road from four stories under the proposed project to two to three stories to provide a uh, gradual transition between the lower density uses to the east and the revised massing alternative. So that is their statement that they're saying there. Looking at figure 3-7B, which is in the final EIR, the massing of the proposed project, reduced intensity alternative and revised massing alternative viewed from the east with approximate heights. I have this in quotes. The majority of buildings along Old County Road are between 30 and 40 feet still. There's only one 20-foot building. So if you go back, and I'm going to ask that you do this as a city council, really go back and look at figure 3-7B, because that's what they're consistently going back to, saying, oh, this is why, you know, this is how we've mitigated the impact. And um, there's really no change whatsoever. <clears throat> there's a um, quote on the um, ABAG website, Association of Bay Area Governments. And um, they employ a, a, a website called Focus. You may have heard of it. It emphasizes the need for focused growth as well as the con um, uh, conservation of natural resources. In particular, Focus encourages the development of complete communities, neighborhoods with housing, jobs, shopping, parks, schools, and other services near transit, transit services as a way to increase the range of housing and transportation cho uh, choices in the region. And this is part of the Bay Area Initiative. Um, why then is this transit-oriented development, San Carlos Transit Village, built so close to the railroad tracks that according to the EIR sound expert who was here addressing both Planning Commission and the City Council, will have to keep all windows and doors closed because of sound, in turn creating a transit-oriented development that will be running heating, ventilation, air conditioning units 24-7. 
Is this really the true goal of ABAG and FOCUS? Is this really the kind of development that you want to push forward? It doesn't really relate well to what the whole focus is for, for the um, Grand Boulevard Initiative and for having buildings that are, that are truly um, environmentally friendly. And my question to the Sierra Club too, if they really realize this and know this too, because these are not very uh, environmentally friendly buildings. I am just asking that you lower the height, lower the density. It's going to take care of traffic. It's going to take care of massing. It's going to take care of all these things that are going to affect the whole city, not just East San Carlos. So thank you for your time, and, and please consider sending this back to the developer for, for some rethought. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Paul Maginetti. Hi, uh, Paul Maginetti. I live on Springfield Drive in San Carlos, and I'm on the board of GESC. Um, I want to paraphrase this, make it a little easier. At the end of the last meeting two weeks ago, I would summarize my feelings as sad and, and frustrated. And I want to explain why. Um, one of the instructions that you got from city staff was that in a case where experts disagree, to go ahead and decide that there is no significant impact. As if, to use a baseball reference again, the tie base goes to the runner. But it can make a difference. For example, um, one expert for hazardous waste stated that xylene was not a carcinogen. I went online and it's not quite that simple. So if you were to decide to agree with the city representative that it wasn't, you could be putting the community at risk. Another issue I have is the way it's, the conclusions are presented. Um, when they were talking about traffic impacts, it was presented as having 20% less traffic, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure on the, on the number, but what they really meant was it's 20% less than it could be. Kind of like putting a, a slab of, of butter on the table and say, well, this is low fat butter. It's still gonna have a big impact. And the other issue is, it, they, and they called them improvements, not mitigations, that they could reach out to other projects, for example, the multimodal station as perhaps improving an issue with parking or um, the Grand Boulevard plan to route traffic down Walnut and then Holly as a way to improve traffic, not mitigate it, but improve it. I found those characterizations troubling. I think we can all remember in grammar school, we get a, a, a sudden spot quiz and we'd all have to take the quiz and at the end the class would grade the quiz you would turn to the person behind you you would hand your quiz to them I'm look, looking to you guys as the desk behind the staff to take a look at this with the prudent judgment and critical thinking that I know you're capable of as you decide these things that being said, um, there's one thing that I do need to state for the record. For years, we have been treated not as stakeholders, deserve to have our, cards, our concerns addressed, but it's a problem to be handled. I requested documents under the California Public Records Act because we were getting no information, only silence and propaganda. What I discovered was, was a city staff that didn't just advocate for the project, but in some cases has acted to undermine our efforts at a true dialogue. This, this conduct was at times so beyond the pale that I felt compelled to make a formal complaint. This conduct shows that claims of impartiality are false and that the EIR conclusions are not objective but are tainted by special interests 
and hidden agendas. I don't say that lightly, and I take no pleasure in it, but I have to state that for the record. Um, and lastly, in terms of hazardous waste, um, I looked up for the plan, and it makes a lot of sense, but in one case, it does fall short. It's inadequate, and that is in the testing of arsenic along the uh, old Ellsberg, along with all of them, any, any disturbance of the soil, you need to test it for things that a prudent person based on past history could expect, and then decide what to do with it. And in the case of arsenic, you would take it to a class three uh, landfill. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Hey, Paul, yeah. uh, just one question, that last part. The disturbance of the, of the soil, you're concerned about disturbing it, making it airborne, and anything that's in the soil? This is our only chance to clean that up. Hmm. And I live downstream from it. So eventually it's going to end up not only in our neighborhoods, but eventually the bay. So this is the time to do it right. So as with the PAMP facility, I'll be checking with uh, county health to make sure that things are done properly and that corners are not cut. Okay, thank you. Feng Wei uh, Lee. Uh, I have some handouts. Can you have them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here he's going to give you some documents. You'll have it. Thank you, Steph. Thanks. Our newest board member, by the way. We need one more step. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, just um, one second. I noticed that one of the council members left, and it's a public hearing, and, and I, I think it might be yeah, good to take a short break. Mm -hmm. Sure. Let's take a short break. That sounds good.
Should I? Yes, sir. Go ahead. I'm interrupting uh, your presentation, by the way. I'm sorry? I, was, I apologize for interrupting your presentation. No, that's okay. That's okay. I okay. need time to take a deep breath mm. anyway. Um, <coughs> Mayor, uh, Councillors, uh, my name is Fenway Lee. I am the new, uh, I just get elected to as one of the board member of GSC. And I'm also, uh, in my daytime job is a uh, Senior simulator at DreamWorks. So a lot of this, the the data we show here is going to based on my uh, basic physics knowledge I do at work. Um, okay, let's get started. So uh, I want to get ugly first. So we call ourselves the city of good living, but. I've been living, I moved here for two years. We, I just, well, that's considered relatively new. I have a newborn. He is five, uh, five months, almost six months now. Uh, I believe he is watching the, the webcast. Um, hello, I don't know where the camera is. I think it's that one. <laughs> okay, sorry. But we don't, f we are not, we, we happy to have he coming to the family, but we are not, not happy uh, in general as living here and have to um, have known about this and have to even stay standing here fighting for this. Um, that doesn't make me feel like living in a city of good living. Um, we feel, uh, as Ben said, uh, we feel this last time in the uh, planning commission meeting that the whole thing feel like rigged. We have, in the end, we ha we, they call for a vote, but they really telling everyone said that, okay, this is not approving the project, this is just certify, certify the project, and certify doesn't mean you agree with the, pro the proposed project or you agree with the report. That's, um, well, English is not my na native, native language, but I believe in any dictionary certified does mean certain degree of approval. And I'm sure you're going to hear this soon, next, uh, later after this, from one of the members. They're going to tell you that, um, okay, you vote for this, but you don't have to agree, you don't have to, this is just certified, you, you get your chance to, you, you get your entitlement later, but really, if you don't feel comfortable, there's, there's nothing wrong says no um, to this project. <clears throat> okay. So we've been, um, we've, been pre we've been spending our own time, we do so many researches to try, we, we find so many evidence that prove, um, that prove the final EIR is either incorrect or, or invalid. The plan, but we present that to planning commission and they seem to choose to, they either rigged or choose to ignore all our comments. So here I have to, I have to, you get all the, the old data, but here I'm going to present you some new data and hope to bring up some new thinkings. So parking, this is something old here, but there is simply just not enough parking. There will be, based on the research done by UC Irvine, there we, in the United States, we own 1.95 vehicles per household. And so that, that vehicles, so first nobody going to rent an apartment, not going to rent two parking space. So we, the, the best case, we park in one in the apartment building and another one in the free parking spaces. So that means roughly 300 cars uh, is going to try to find free parking spaces. But those cars has to share with all the retails in the, in the proposed project and the offices, employees in the project. Not, not only that, and on top of that, there will be subleasing tenants. We get to that later because the high density uh, resident is very, very likely to have sublease, and that's going to introduce even more vehicles. So I do simple math. Approximately 700 vehicles is going to fighting for that 200 very far away parking spot. 
And that, who, nobody is going to do that. How, what are they going to do? They're going to flood into east, east side of St. Carlos. They're going to take our curbs, take our driveways, just for their convenience. And that's not to mention it's going to be bring, bring crimes, um, uh, more traffic and dangers to the neighborhood. We ha we we have kids playing in the in the in, on the street. Um, that's fine because there's now a, a lot of pro a lot of traffic, but not there won't be if this project get built. So here I'm asking you not <coughs> don't let the resident pay the price for your wrong decision. And in in conclusion, for the parking in parking aspect, the final EIR is impractical because it doesn't consider the flow, the real flow of the, park, the traffic. And let's go to transportation. Uh, we have a, a transportation expert presenting, but I have to say that sadly, his, his data and conclusion is incorrect. For example, I remember somewhere in the, uh, in the report it says, um, Although the parking space is very far away, but there's really no difference walking 0.5 miles and one mile. So people would choose to, to walk one mile to find a parking space. And we all know that's not true. If we can find, after a couple of tries, if we can find an easier, faster, closer parking spot, we're going to take it. That means we take the east, east side neighborhood take parking spot. <clears throat> not to mention there will be, uh, also there's so many doubts in that, in, that, in that report, for example, it's comparing St. Carlos, which is located in Mid Peninsula, to Union City and San Jose. It's, well, it's not even, uh, it's not even uh, uh, nearby cities. So first, they are completely different that demographic, and they, hence, they have different resident background, and they probably, probably have all different occupations too, and we definitely have all different house prices. And all this data, well, this is just background data, but that, what that leads to is we are, we, are, we are going to have different habits for using public transportation. Well, I'm not saying that, the risk, that our commute pattern is going to be a certain way, but I'm just saying that the report is uh, in, in a <laughs> inapplicable. It's comparing apple to orange, or more like you, you come, you, you buy a house and compare a three bedroom to a two bedroom. You say, okay, the two bedroom is a lot cheap, so, so cheap. So we should buy the three bedroom the same price. That's not a good comparison. More about noise. We have so many discussion about noise and they simply just, just skim it. Um, Simply, um, the, the sun travels through space uh, and it has, this, it has reflection, refraction, and diffraction effects to go around the obstacles. And this is not research, researched. I'm going to get to detail later. So because of all these different effects, it's turning the new building into a giant speaker. Consider, like, try to picture just a giant speaker right next to the rail and facing to the east side neighborhood. Every exterior wall would become a new, new sound so source, and the sound in each building and the span amplitude, the sound amplitude am accumulate because of the, the wide span. So that, and I recall in final EIR, the researchers only consider taking distance from a single point source. Simply it just says because the distance is such and such and the, the voice level is, is such and such. But it doesn't take the entire span, the entire reflection, refraction and diffraction of the new building to the east side neighborhood into account. Therefore, the, I have to say the final EIR is incompetent. Uh, sadly, it doesn't seem to play.
Okay. Um, my so there's no quick time. No. Okay. Wow. Seems like once I click it, it's uh... okay. I I work around this. Sorry for the delay. <coughs> it's meant to. Be a sim uh, 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 animation. Okay, but we can still we can still see, and also you have the the printout. I'm I'm so happy I have the printout now. Um, this is how the sound track uh, sound can see the sound goes in straight line. But this trend here, uh, I take a couple simple points. So each on each point is emit emitting sound in each direction. So this is when the train go by across this period of time and how far the sound of the train will travel. Uh, it's pretty much travel in every direction because there's no obstacles. However, with the new building, it's, it's reflecting 70 to 80 percent of the t percent of the, the sound to the east, east neighborhood with this, all, this, all these building walls. And you can, I mean, I don't have to, you don't have to hear it, you just, the density of the line pretty much more or less means the amplitude of the sound. So you can see how much amplitude it, in, it bring in, bring to the east side neighborhood. Does anyone know how I can pre then from, okay, this will work. Okay. So n next to the, so that's not only the, the, the only effects to the sound. I bring this uh, many times in the planning commission, but they choose, to, choose to, to ignore. I don't know why, but we, not, I'm, we are not standing here just only because we're living inside. We also, on, we also consider the entire San Carlos. The sound, the new building is going to create some focused noise toward the, the other side of the San Carlos. The sound is going to reflect between, gap, between gaps in the, between the building and focus to this, the west side, much more like when a horn or when you're trying to talk to somebody in a long distance, you make this horn-shaped gesture, it makes the sound travel farther, further. And that also not considered in final EIR. That makes final ER inadequate. In yeah, also, I I'm, was hoping to have a video, but we just have to look at this picture. Remember that, remember the old, old picture is, is emitting to all direction, but now through this gap and the reflection and diffraction within this building. Um, Turning, making these channels of noises focusing, and on some focus area, it's probably getting more, even higher amplitude than the the other any than any other other places in in San Carlos, and it's just creating these channels shooting toward this side. You just have to wish you are not you don't live on any of these new buildings, and that is not researched in final EIR. Bounce noise. Also, somebody mentioned this too. This is what happens to the new resident in the new building. Um, to, to reduce noise, the only thing, and that's also based on the, the sound export, the tenant has to, to close their ne the windows all the time. But what happened to that? If you close windows, there's no outlet, so the sound would bounce back, bounce back and forth in the room, and that and that's simply just Amplify the sound level 
think if you talk the same level in a closed room, it's much louder than you talk the same level in the outdoor. So that turning, just, just, just an example here, is turning the new buildings into, a, in, into a subwoofer boxes. And it's going to damage hearing in the long run. There's plenty of research talking about low frequency, how low frequency noise hurting human health. And also get, get somehow technical, he, technical here. California building code requires ventilation in any habitable, habitable rooms. So according to the sound expert, if we have to close all the windows and doors in, uh, in order to keep a habitable living environment, that means those doors and windows cannot be considered as doors and windows because you're just never going to open it. It's more like it's just a window shape decoration, if you think that way. And that, viol that makes the building viol violate the building code. So they, cannot build, they just cannot build the building this way. And uh, the quick conclusion of all this is, I find it, yeah, it's ignorant. It, ignorant the fact that the window is not a window. The, the bounce noise is hurting human health. So very quickly, I want to show, this is how the sound bouncing in the, in the building. And you can, if you compare it to the, the earlier, earlier, uh, present, uh, earlier illustrations, this is even denser than any of the previous illustrations. That means they are, they are enduring much greater sound pressure than anyone else in the city. Air qualities, um, new constructions with no, no um, exceptions produce dust, methanol, and heavy metal. We all know what does cause asthma, heavy metal cause all, all kinds of long-term uh, long disease, and methanol is uh, somehow get, uh, recently get more publicity. It's, it's, it's pretty much, it's simply, it's in glue, so it's stored in, you can see methanol in plywood, pans, margin, and finishes. But study being shown that it caused not only death, and also in even a small amount, it caused cancer, leukemia, and God, there's so many different words. Um, but it's bad for you. So, Apnose, because it's so deep in the glue, it can keep emit, uh, it's emitting in two years uh, in, high concentrate, uh, in high concentrations. So that, that, of course, that's been considered in any new constructions. But we are different because the construction site is so close to Caltrain. The Caltrain turbulence, if you ever see that standing in the platform seeing the express going by, Caltrain turbulence is very, very high. And that is not considered in final EIR. That makes final EIR irresponsible. So here, I was also hoping to have some interesting animation, but we just have to look at the steel here. This is in one day how far the, the, the toxin can travel from the train rail, uh, from the new building to the neighborhood. It's not, it's bad, but it's not terrible. But when the, the, build, uh, when the, the train goes by, it kicks all this, uh, this turbulence, and it's going to try to, to carry all these toxins two times to three times further. And again, I have just have to say the report is irresponsible. It's not putting the report, it's not even considered, it's not even mentioned. Lighting. Final year, I only consider direct light, direct lighting. Um, but to, what, it, what is contribute to the illuminance, illuminance we, we receive in our eye is including direct lighting and bounce lighting. 
the bounce ID is simply just hit when the light is not direct, even though it's not direct hit, it just hit somewhere else, but it bounced back. It can contribute up to 20% 20, 20 up to 100% of the overall illumination. So although the new building might not cast shadow directly, because actually we can already see the new building cast shadows on, peop on our houses already, but you might argue that, okay, that's not a lot of houses. But because it's casting all this big shadow area, and this shadow area is just a big block that doesn't have bounce lighting, doesn't contribute to the surrounding, surrounding indirect lighting. That's going to reduce the, uh, uh, the illuminate, overall, illu overall illumination of adjacent area by 20 to 100%. Again, this not study, it's not considered all I'm asking is it's not even studied or mentioned in final, EI, in final EIR. And because of time, I pretty much do this one night. I don't have research on this aspect, but these are also very important, such as invasion of privacy. All these high-rise buildings, they're going to see through our, our backyard, see through our windows, see through our skylight. And that is not study. And that also violates violates California building code. Crime rate, we, own, we know that more people, well, no judgment to the, to, I'm not making prediction what's, who is going to be a new tenant, but more people does mean more crime rate. And for, in addition to new tenant, also, also there will be new commuters, new pe the people use Caltrans, they are going to our communities and bring more possibilities of crime. And finally, the electromagnetic field um, is also a re newly found uh, um, factor affecting human health. Um, as Tim says, okay, so let's go back a little bit. It's already measured 100 units in the, around the trail. That means the new, resi uh, the new resident is absorbing 100 units every day. But just give you, give you a, a perspective, three units is considered safe. In, we don't have the, I have to say, we don't have the standard here, but in more advanced country, like some North European, they, they say three unit is the only, you have to below three unit to be, to residential area has to be below three. Not to mention, now that I know that the high-speed rail, rail is going to put these transformers, that's also going to increase this number greatly. And also another example is so microwave is, uh, depending on where you stand, but if you stand next to microwave, is about 80 units. So consider yourself living in a microwave oven for that's probably what they, those new tenants' life is going to be. That also, that also tells us final EIR is negligent. Okay, this is the best part. Uh, willing to live. Who will want to live there? I, asking, I hope I ask you to ask this question to yourself. If you happen like one day if you lose all your money and you just have a fixed income, would you want to live here or just go to, there's plenty of, re, uh, plenty of uh, apartment building here for you to choose. There's San Mateo, Belmont, Foster City, Rose Show, they, are, they all have very good apartment. Why, given all these other choices, why will one live here? Actually, I cannot think of one. So I do some research, I uh, take some of my own time, I talk to my friends and friends' friends, um, during this, uh, during October 6th to October 26th, um, ranging from full-time employees from Google, DreamWorks, Facebook to an employee person. Uh, also, I mentioned in the planning commission, I, I, take, I talk to a, uh, I'm not sure about the political correct way to, to say it, but I, I talked to a guy who's sleeping on the bench next to Rebel City Caltrain. And well, I know him very well because he's, his name's Bob. We talk sometimes. I think, um, and he is also in the survey. Okay, the result, the result is 
Only 1.92% of the people want to stay, want to live there, given all the conditions, given like if he happened to have to move. But all other options are still, still, still open. And only, and 98.08% of, of the people don't want to, just don't want to, don't, don't even want to consider that. Because there's a plenty of other choices. And out of this 98.8%, uh, uh, actually 100% almost, uh, 100% of full-time employee doesn't want to live there. That brings us to house value. We all know, um, based on the old effect mentioned above, house, house value are based on the environment and humans, ex just human expectation. So that's already directly impact the property value of the surrounding neighborhood. But what's going to happen next, indirectly next? Because based on the research of what willing to leave, these are not going to attract middle class fam families. They have to lower their re income or open to sublease to attract people with lower socioeconomical status. And that's just like a, that's just going to lead to a cascading effect. For example, downgrade, not to mention, first impact the, impact the property value, bring crimes downgrade school, school district, and so on. Just think it's Palo Alto. I don't want to bring the racist, racism card here, but it's Palo Alto is a good example of policy lead to migration due to social economical status. So at one point they have this policy, they decide to, uh, I don't have to go to, into, into detail. They have, the, they have the policy, they seem reasonable, they, have to, they want to raise, raise the fee of certain group of people, and that just lead to all these big migrations, and turn out it doesn't really do anything good to the, to the, in, to, to the overall communities. But that, so, the, so the, in the long, short term, of course, it's going to impact the east side of San Carlos, but we are, as, as we are a group, as a, a, a one city. So unless you consider separating east side of St. Carlos as East St. Carlos, we are going to lower the east side, house value in the east side is going to lower the overall rating uh, and value of St. Carlos. So in conclusion, final EIR is negligent, incomplete, incompetent, in ignorant, in applicable, uh, applicable, and irresponsible. They need to redesign and redo the research. Back to the drawing board, come up with a better plan. Even if the project barely meets the, okay, so backward a little bit. We, we, I, we see this a lot in final ER report, it just says, it has no significant report, uh, no significant impact if they do, we do such and such and such. But there's no plan to do that such and such and such. And something is that such and such and such is even rely on some, volunteer, some volunteering of the resident, like uh, if everyone just start to take less car, there will be enough parking. That's like telling how about we just, rich people just donate all their money and there will be no poverty. It's the same thing. So even if the project barely meets the, the no impact, okay, so pretend it's not true, but pretend it really meets the no impact standard, barely. It still bring no value to the cities. It's only, it's only bringing, bringing damages. We, as the city of good living, should use a higher, should definitely use a higher standard to make a better living. And I found this interesting enough. I found this on Wikipedia and on our city prof profile in on our web page. I just said, St. Carlos, city of good living, and for a small town feel. And everything they do here is against it, this principle. 
So I'm here, I, I'm, uh, I'm asking to you to have some sympathy. Uh, we are the new family just in, the, just in town, struggling our life. The last thing I want to see is seeing my kids living in shadow, in dust, in toxins, have to face the danger of strangers walking my door, walking in front of my door, strange cars, and, and lose, lose the, the beautiful view. So please, um, don't, please don't, based on the, 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 prof, the, the beautiful view, uh, beautiful vision of the city, please do not ruin the city, and please do not sacrifice our quality of life and health for their revenue or ego. Thank you. Thank you. David Crabb. Honorable Mayor and members of the uh, City Council, um, I'm David Crabb. I live here in San Carlos. I'm an architect. And I'm going to give you a handout, which is sort of an update of uh, the letter I sent you back in December 20 uh, about an alternative approach to the uh, transit village uh, from the uh, Holly Street North portion of it, which seems to be one of the areas that's of most concern to the east side neighbors uh, uh, to the project. Uh, and uh, I, I got involved with this, uh, the transit village uh, or aware of it about two and a half years ago when they were doing the draft EIR and I sat in on some meetings and I heard the at that point the east side residents make the same points that they're making now and I listened to them and I felt that there was something that possibly could be done to uh, at least respond to some of their concerns uh, from an architectural point of view but I also uh, have the, uh, the desire to see the full 280 units there because I uh, am very much supporting of transit area development and the more units, are, that's a, a, a size of units, 40 units per acre and, and so on, somewhat larger, is about the minimal that should be uh, really within a transit area development. So I've been trying to work on a, a compromise architectural plan since I'm an architect I get a little spare time and so I was playing with this thing and the, uh, the letter I sent you before uh, had uh, uh, a, a scheme that uh, uh, the, the plan is it would be changed now but if you can remember it at all it, what I was trying to do was to drop the uh, levels of the buildings uh, facing the east side residence which relates to the stepping back type of situation and if you look at the diagram that you have now there are several things here but it's, it's color coded and if you look at the color code, I actually uh, converted this project. I still have 280 units. Basically, their units, I actually plugged in their units with a couple of exceptions where I had to kind of tweak it a little bit with a, with a unit. Uh, and I come up with uh, buildings that are primarily two and three stories, or primarily three stories with some two-story elements facing the east side residence four stories uh, in portions along El Camino, and actually some three-story along El Camino. And the way that I did that was the original plan, if, if you, uh, this drawing I just handed to you is uh, the bottom, the top portion is basically a diagram of their project, which is four buildings, uh, very large buildings, one very large building at the end, smaller one, another big large building and a smaller one. And uh, the areas that seem to be of most concern to the neighbors are the air, this area from the first street down because this, this corner is a commercial type of facility, so they're not quite so concerned about shadows and so on. Um, and so there were some issues, I think, that were talked about uh, from the uh, east side residents that uh, talk, there was some talk about view corridors and so on. And the uh, architects of the uh, legacy plan uh, tried to accommodate that in a couple of places. And if you look at the top 
the, the top drawing, which is the legacy plan, these arrows that come through are view corridors. And so they have created two view corridors through here. They, uh, this one on the end, they is I, I show it bouncing back. It basically means you can't see. You're going to see the building. You're not going to see through. And uh, that one apparently is, is impossible to do a view corridor there pretty much because there's a utility line here that causes some problems. But the second building here, they actually have blocking the view as well. And so I was converted this to a, a five buildings instead of four and, and opened another, a third, an extra view corridor through. Um, so the, uh, if you, hopefully you, you did in fact have a chance to read my original letter and look at those drawings. And if you remember, there were a couple of perspectives in there to show uh, how this project might look in comparison to the massing of the, uh, the project that uh, Legacy did. I think it would improve quite a bit the east side. It's not going to give them their panoramic view that they would like, unfortunately. But uh, they have talked about maybe being willing to live with three-story buildings. And this, when you start looking at how you see a building and how it, 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 it steps back, this allows it to give the sense of a three-story building, even though it may go up to four stories on the El Camino side, because you don't see that four story because of the way you do it. And that cross section in that first letter I did kind of explains how that works. And so um, they've talked about uh, building height and bulk, so the, uh, I've tried to approach that. Talked about noise back, uh, bounce back. Well, if the buildings drop down to two stories and three stories along there, there's going to be less of that potentially. Uh, talked about view blockage. Well, we got one extra view corridor. It's still not great. It's, you know, I, not ideal, sorry. Uh, and then shadows. This is going to reduce the shadows, uh, 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 potentially toward the other. Though I don't believe the shadows are as much of a problem as, as the east side people think they are. Uh, but uh, it would because the our buildings would be lower. So what I'm asking you tonight is, uh, well, two things. First, uh, I, I want, I'd like you to, uh, uh, what do you have to do? Certify, certify the, the current EIR. Uh, to get this, this project moving. It's been sitting for two and a half years uh, just to get it moving. And the, uh, this, pro this alternative scheme that I have is built into the EIR as it exists as those alternative massing uh, schemes. It's not exactly what I've done, but the concept is there. And basically the EIR says that if you, uh, you know, change the massing, it's, it, it's not going to affect the EIR one way or another. So I would say, first step one, Certify the EIR, so this thing can go to step two, which is the entitlements page uh, section. But in, t in stage two, I would like to see the council include uh, not only the planning commission's improvement measures as they sit now, but also an expectation that a revised massing plan will be, will be developed to mitigate some of the east side residents' uh, concerns. Because if you don't tell them now, the, what you've got is what you've got. Uh, you know, they, uh, they've been going along, uh, and uh, unless they get some strong sense from the, the, this, uh, this panel, uh, they are going to just keep with their four-story buildings. Uh, now, I can't 100% guarantee that it will work perfectly if they, if they look at this alternative scheme, but at this point, I don't feel that there's been any serious attempt to, in fact, try it. Uh, and I have met with the architect for a couple of hours one day and looked it over and and I think she took it back and, and briefly looked at it. She's not obviously being paid to do a full-blown study, and so uh, you know, she didn't go much further on it. But I, I believe uh, that she's a very competent person and uh, could, in fact, pull this off. Uh, so again, uh, if you could include, a, 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 in addition to the improvement measures, some expectation that you would like to see some sense or some proof uh, that uh, the uh, legacy has looked at the alternative massing alternatives, uh, and along, you know, in, in conjunction with the east side residents, and it moves into that, that next stage. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else like to speak on this project while we have the public hearing open? Okay. Seeing none, entertain a motion to close. Mr. Rubens, then we uh, make a motion to close the public hearing. Okay. Moved. Roll call. Councilmember Clapper? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Grocott? Yes. <clears throat> okay, I think this is where we get into uh, 
our list of questions. So, where do we want to start? Mr. Olbert, did you want to start? Where do you uh, want to? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd be happy to start. Um, may I ask, just in terms of a, a process thing, do we want to do like one or two questions each and then hand off the baton, basically, and that way we don't have one person? I'm certainly open to that idea if, if the rest of the council is happy with that. Bounce it around a little bit. Let's give it a try. Okay. And I don't know that we'll get through all of our questions tonight. This is our last item, but um, it depends on how late you want to go and keep continuing. And Mr. Mayor, um, yes, sir. Uh, just a just I wanted to point something out. It, since you're at the question um, point in the in the uh, meeting, um, we have our special legal counsel Anna Shimko here tonight to answer any secret questions that you might have oh, about good. process. Thanks. And uh, she did have a hand in um, developing the the EIR that you are considering tonight. So, in other words, if we want to ask questions about. EIR and CEQA and that sort of thing, if we have any of those, we should do that yes. uh, first. Okay. All right. Um, I think before we get into discussion, okay. we'll be the time Fine. to do that. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Let's fire away with questions. And, and per Mr. Rubin's comments, if you have something that would pertain to the EIR process, CEQA, and so forth. Uh, tonight would be the night to do that while she's here. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my first question, I want to start with something uh, fairly simple and straightforward. Um, I'd like to get some uh, more detail and actually be pointed to by staff uh, in the EIR analysis of where the impact of the pro that the project will have on the nature and character of San Carlos is contained. Um, uh, this is an issue that is of, of potential concern to me, and it's something that a couple of the speakers even have touched on, that, that um, this development could trigger a fairly significant change in the character of the way San Carlos looks um, and feels, for lack of a better term, along uh, El Camino Real. And um, I'm not sure I actually saw much of an in-depth analysis about that. Um, Council Member, my name is Michael Cage. You know, I'm with Atkins. And um, nature and character of San Carlos is, is to me, a very um, more of a planning a term. There's, there's a certain level of vagueness to it. I'm not sure that that is something that's typically uh, described in a CEQA document. Um, just offhand, I'm thinking that um, they will probably be included in uh, such uh, topics as visual and also um, compliance with uh, land use um, plans and regulations as, as uh, described in your general plan. So I would point to the visual impact section as well as the uh, land use section of the document. Yeah, um, I, I recall you know, re in reading those sections seeing some mention of it. I, I didn't see uh, what I would think of as kind of an integrated uh, characterization of it. I, and I also forgot to explain in context for my question that um, it's an issue that was particularly highlighted for me in discussions I had with a, a resident in town, just to be clear, not from the east side, who actually spent most of his career uh, involved in uh, uh, defending against sequel lawsuit challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I don't, I'm not trying, you know, I may have misunderstood part of what he told me, but I, I don't want to necessarily say we should all accept his expertise, but it, it was not a casual question, and it was sort of from his perception it was kind of odd that there wasn't more of a focused discussion of that. Um, so, um, but that answers my question that the, the element, uh, that answer is basically scattered through a number of different I, I would suggest that the nature and character of San Carlos is really just driven by the general plan as a planning document. Um, the, the CEQA document, again, is, 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 is looks at the, the, um, the potential adverse effects of a project based on the CEQA guidelines. And again, I, I don't, um, there's not specific sections in the document where we talk about nature and character. And to me, those are more planning terms than, than CEQA terms. Um, I understand that. And I, I probably have a slightly different take than you do on, on, uh, on uh, how that applies in this particular instance. I do know that there is discussion about how, even when looking at a particular project, um, it's, it's appropriate to consider the growth-inducing aspects of a project. Um, and. And that's, in fact, part of what my thinking was about how this, I use the word trigger, could trigger development. Mm -hmm. um, 
development which may be in fact consistent with the general plan but it still may trigger development nonetheless and growth inducement is described in the CEQA document there, there is a section on uh, it, but and again you have to remember that CEQA looks at physical changes um, that uh, might be associated with with the construction of a project or whatever document uh, or type of um, either either, the, either it's a program if it's a planning document or um, project level for a project such as this well, my, my understanding is uh, that's that's certainly true, but my understanding is that CEQA is actually looking at all significant effects on the environment. Um, the which, physical environment. Uh, yes, but the physical environment includes a number of the things that I was referring to. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay, that, you know, my question basically was where is the discussion, and the answer is the discussion in general is not in a particular place. So I will pass the baton off. I would like to... Just make one comment and, and a question for, for staff, because the answer to Mr. Olbert's question was compliance with general plan. And then when uh, Mr. Hilborn spoke, he talked about certain sections of the general plan and uh, city guidelines that he, he says at least are not being followed. Now, I'm not familiar with those sections that he's talking about, so it'd be nice to have uh, some answer from the staff uh, uh, showing to us of what it was he was referring to and how either staff or the applicant feels those sections were complied with mm -hmm. because I think I think that does get to what you were you were talking to uh, according to how your answer your, your question was answered there is a section in the secret document in the land use discussion on whether or not the project complies with plans and policies in the general plan that were adopted to either avoid or minimize significant environmental effects. Um, that, the, the, the key there under CEQA is those that were adopted to minimize or avoid significant environmental effects or changes on the environment. So um, the determination of whether or not the project um, complies with the general plan itself is really outside the CEQA process. So that the CEQA process is specific to um, those policies uh, adopted uh, for environmental effects of a project. Um, outside, of course, the, the, we, we have a discussion of whether or not the, um, the project complies with the, the, the zoning for the area or the general plan land use designations of the, the specific project site. Uh, you confuse me with your answer because if I understood what Mr. Hilborn was saying, he's saying that, look, your general plan was was approved inside of a CEQA process. So, right. so therefore, when you go into a, an actual specific project, mm -hmm. that project has to comply with your general plan and the general plan guidelines, the visual guidelines that are given in the general plan for development. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know what section he was referring to. I haven't read it, so I don't, I don't know what specifically he was referring to, but I would like to have something from staff that says, okay, Mr. Hilburn was referring to this section, this is what it says, and this is how we feel or the applicant feels it does comply, or maybe staff looks at it and says, Mr. Hilburn's got a very good point and it doesn't comply and the applicant needs to mitigate that, that issue. Well, is, 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 there, is there something that I'm missing? A good, so the general plan designates um, land use designations within the city, as you know. Now, there's does. specific land use designations for the area for, under which the project is being proposed. So the CEQA document looks at what that land use designation is and, and, and um, makes a determination on whether or not the proposed project falls within what's applicable under that land use designation. That's described in the environmental document. Um, CEQA also has a standard of significance um, that states whether or not the project would comply with the um, policies in the general plan that have been adopted to avoid or minimize adverse environmental effects. That's also included in the environmental document. Um, there's a table in the land use section which lists those policies that have been adopted in the general plan um, in association with environmental effects and then whether or not the project um, uh, complies with those policies or doesn't comply with those policies. Um, the specific res reference made by the uh, the speaker, I, I um, would need to look a little more in depth into the and environmental document. And that's what document. I'm asking for is that, okay. yeah, that's, that's yeah, I would have to explore that right. uh, a little more in depth. Very good, very good, thank you. Sure, 
you, did you have another question? You felt like you Mayor, lots of the, the balance Mayor, of your time. Do you mind if I step in on this issue just a little bit? Because uh, it is confusing. Ahead. Yeah. Um, just for reference, for those of you who have been wondering who I am the last couple meetings, uh, I am Anna Shimko, and I am a CEQA practitioner, um, a lawyer. I've represented the city of San Carlos on special projects for a number of years now, including the Palo Alto Medical Foundation project. So I was engaged in 2010 in order to assist the staff in reviewing the responses to the draft EIR, developing the final EIR, and giving my and my team's view of what additional studies needed to be undertaken, what additional discussions needed to be in the document in order to assure from our standpoint, obviously you have to decide for yourselves, but from our standpoint that the EIR was legally sufficient and legally valid. This issue of general plan consistency under CEQA is actually very confusing. Let me see if I can shed a little light on it. Everything that Mr. Kay said was absolutely correct. In terms of the standards of significance, the measurements that you use to decide whether or not an impact is significant under CEQA, certain of those come from your general plan, where general plan policies were adopted for the express purpose of ameliorating environmental impacts. A really good example of one in San Carlos is the, um, the traffic level of service goal that is adopted of 0.85. Clearly, that was adopted in order to address environmental impacts. So if the project will not comport with that portion of the general plan, then the project will have a significant impact. In that case, the project would probably have a significant impact under traffic, and it might have one under land use as well for failing to comport with a general plan policy adopted to protect the environment. Now, I, I believe what the earlier speaker was reading from was that portion of the EIR in the land use section that says, even though we're going to go through the policies in the general plan that were adopted for environmental purposes and judge whether or not there are land use impacts, the ultimate decision of whether the project is consistent with the EIR is one that is up to the decision-making agency at a later point, and indeed involves a lot of balancing and weighing of general plan policies, and it involves the entirety of the general plan, not just those policies that were picked out for EIR purposes as addressing environmental impacts. And so CEQA specifically does say, for instance, that the environmental setting section of an EIR might address overall inconsistencies with plans and policies. And it's very clear under CEQA that that's an environmental setting topic that's separate from the impacts of the EIR. I don't know if I've helped or confused things, but it is a very confusing issue. And at least from my review of the EIR, the EIR did it accurately and sufficiently by pulling out the policies of the general plan that were aimed at environmental impacts but then down the road, when the project comes back to you for consideration, you are the ones that get to decide, that have to decide, whether or not the project comports with the general plan as a whole. And if it doesn't, it can't be approved. Does that help at all? Sort of. Uh, I'm going to okay. go ahead and open it up and let people ask questions. They might come back to you. And I okay. think, stay there, because uh, I think Mr. Yeah. Collins has a question very direct. Thank you, Anna. I I don't know if you, you may have cleared things up. You may have made things more money. Just, well, just. it's really not my fault. It's the legislature. So we could take it up with that. Maybe you can help me. I, I heard something that I, I, I think I need some clarification. Are you saying that when the EIR is being formulated and the decision is being made between what has no impact or, or significant or less than significant, that those judgments are made based on what is in generally in the general plan? Those judgments are based on thresholds of significance. Sometimes those come from the general plan. For instance, there are traffic level of mm -hmm. service thresholds that come from the general plan. There are often noise thresholds that come from the general plan. There are other thresholds that don't come from the general plan that come from, for instance, the CEQA guidelines and the checklist under CEQA 
that is used to formulate the thresholds. They come from commonly accepted scientific principles. So there are a lot of um, geneses of the uh, thresholds, but they definitely often do come from the general plan in the various topic areas. And then in the land use section itself, there's a specific question in the land use checklist that asks whether the project will conflict with policies in the general plan that were adopted to protect the environment. And there, some of those are going to be standalone and not addressed in the other sections. And some of them will have been addressed in the other sections like noise and traffic. So, so basically the, the, the EIR has, depending on the category, has, has responded to those guidelines, whether they be CEQA guidelines or general plan guidelines or some other guidelines. And, and that has happened in this particular EIR, that's what you're saying? It has in terms of analyzing the impacts on the physical environment, as Mr. Kay said. There may well be other policies in the general plan um. that have to do with things that I think Councilmember Olbert is um, struggling with that have to do with communica community character and feel and things that aren't necessarily captured by a physical improvement and a physical impact of the project. And those are the types of things that you will be looking at when you get to the project approval phase, when you're looking at all of the general plan policies and the zoning and mm -hmm. everything else. So, the, so while the EIR can be technically perfect, mm -hmm. the overall project can just either feel right or feel wrong. Yes. Oh, okay. That's correct. All right. And as you know, I, I think general plans are written, hence the title, in a sufficiently general manner that you're going to be able to bring your views of whether that project feels right or doesn't feel right. And you can mold that project in the city's image when you get to that point in the process. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Clapper. Um, Having been diligently involved with this project going back to 2009 with the Planning Commission, I don't have any pre-discussion questions, and so I'm going to help expedite this portion of the program by relinquishing my time to the rest of you. Okay, very good. Appreciate that. We'll come over here to Mr. Grisilli. I just had a couple, but I know we're just asking one at a time. Uh, Mr. Seve, we have 281 units. Is that what it is? Yes. Okay. Mr. Crab had 221, you know, in your, wherever Mr. Crab is. You have 200. And you're, you're putting 60 somewhere else, or? By the train station, okay. I just, because I couldn't figure out the difference there. Anyway, um, it was said by the speaker, and I, 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 it's probably in here, but I probably missed it, or I can't remember it. Uh, are we doing, uh, is the CEQA document speak to in-lieu fees, or 15% uh, low income, or what, could you speak to that for a moment? The percentage was. Uh, yeah, we have a BMR ordinance, but it's separate from the CEQA document. Okay, so it wasn't in there. Right. Okay, so it's I didn't miss it. The requirement of the CEQA. No, but it'll come. Talk. It'll come back to, in the entitlement side. It'll. That's it'll correct. come back. So it'll either be fifteen percent. Is fifteen percent the correct number? Well, fifteen percent is our requirement as a city for okay. for development, right? All right. But this is an apartment project. Mm -hmm. So in our couple of things. In our ordinance, it says the developer has a choice. You can either pay a fee mm -hmm. or you can provide the 15% units of those. It's the developer's choice, not our choice? That's right. It's the developer's choice. And that's what in our code? Yes, it's in the code. However, uh, there's been some uh, recent um, law that uh, lawsuits mm -hmm. that have further defined what cities can ask a developer to, to do. Okay. There was a case called the Palmer case. Right, the Palmer case, said, right. That said that cities can't require a developer who's building a, uh, apartments okay. to provide those units in the development. All right, that's fine. I just that wanted to make sure that we clarify. Sure. The speakers went to, said something, and I just wanted to make sure that we clarified that. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah. Huh. I have a, a few questions, remember. Um, I wanted to ask, and maybe this is for uh, the attorney, um, the 
the issue that I had, even with, like I said before, with Wheeler, is already we have a, you know, a, a major artery that comes in and out of San Carlos, being San Carlos Avenue, um, that is heavily impacted in the afternoon from anywhere from 3.30 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon uh, until probably about 6 or so, 6 or 7, depending on the, the evening and depending on the season, actually. Whether it's in, in the wintertime, it's usually worse. Uh, something about being dark and wet and so forth. Um, and already, I, I, at least for me, when I've uh, driven through there, it, it's it's not acceptable. There's been times where I've gotten off the freeway and I I make it through the light at uh, Industrial and it's uh, two or three light changes before I get through the El Camino intersection and then when I get through the El Camino set intersection, it's happened to me twice recently where I think the traffic's going to flow and I go through the intersection and I get stuck and the light changes on me and now I'm s the tail end of my truck is sitting on the El Camino and cars are having to go around the, you know, a few cars because then it's a stop sign so eventually you get through. But that's very uncomfortable and it's very unsafe and so I look at the situation we have right now and I look at the fact that concurrently with this project we're also looking at Wheeler Plaza so that's a that's a um, I forget what the term is it's a foreseeable project is Wheeler and that's uh, help me out Al how many how many units is uh, Wheeler Plaza 108, 108 units yeah. okay so we got 108 units there we're talking 281 units here that's a lot of uh, new customers driving their cars around in San Carlos, all trying to use, well, maybe not all of them, but a, a, you know, a good percentage of people trying to get in and out of town on Holly Street. And I don't see, I didn't see it addressed in Wheeler Project, and I don't see it addressed here except, if I understood it correctly, just saying, well, we'll pay into a fund to improve traffic down the road, and we'll look at that down the road. Problem is, the road's already so impacted that to me, it's something that you should do now, even before you dig any dirt for, for any new units. So how do you address that with this process, or do you? Well, there's, there's a couple of things, and maybe part of it's legal at the end, but the first part, it, to answer your earlier, even earlier question, Holly Street was investigated as part of this uh, EIR and um, so it looked at traffic impacts from this specific project. Holly Street was identified as a problem in our community uh, back with the PAMF EIR and it identified what the problems were and what the mitigations for that project for that project were. Then our general plan came up and said well if you develop any more uh, projects these are all going to contribute to that issue. Uh, so we have to fix the problem. There, the fix is to fix the interchange, the, the Holly 101 interchange, and there's a, there's a plan in place to do that, and the city's moving forward with those mitigations. So, so there are mitigations to fix the problem, and um, it will take a number of years to fix the problem, and all these developments are required to pay into the fund to fix that problem. So that's what this development needs to do. One, it needs to pay into the, tra the traffic fee to fix the problem, which is going to be fixed in the future. Two, it has to reduce the traffic impacts by 20%, or its traffic by 20% through transportation demand measures. So my, the legal question may be, can a city delay or deny a project um, if, if it's mitigated, if you mitigate that impact, and the, the EIR says it's, you can mitigate those significant issues or any traffic issues with this project, can a city then either delay or not approve a project as a result of that? So that's the legal question. But the fixes for those problems are in the future, they're in place, funding sources are being pursued, drawings are being put together to fix the problem. So maybe the attorneys could. So you said fix 101, and you also said uh, a TD, what are those? 
TDM yeah, program. So, the, so one of them is a physical fix to the roadway right. system, which is in place. We know where the problem is. There's a there's a, a plan in place to fix it. Developments have to pay into it. Um, the second piece is this development is required to reduce its own trips by at least 20 percent. That's one of our requirements, one of our city requirements, is that they have to do a number of different measures to reduce the trips just right off the top. So those are two kinds of things that mitigate the significance of impacts as a result of this project. And then you said, so then the, the legal question is, can the city delay projects until the fix is in? Right. But we don't know the answer to that. There may be an answer to that. There may be an answer to that. Sure well, I'll phrase it that way. Well, while the answer is being contemplated, uh, I'd like to make a motion to extend the meeting to 11 o'clock. Second. Well, uh, it, go, please have your vote. Excuse me. Oh, uh, there was a motion. And a second. And a second. And a second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Mr. Good. Rubens. Okay. So. Um, well, I, you know, I hate to, from, from this point, um, talk about something that um, could potentially lead to um, legal issues for the city, um, because I think that's the, the point that um, Al is trying to raise, is, you know, what is the city's legal liability if we say, well, um, pro all projects that are out there that uh, might be in conformance with the general plan um, or general policies of the general plan, can we... Um, stop development or have a moratorium on development until a certain project is done. Um, I think that would create some legal issues for the city based upon the, the property rights of developers. But I don't know, um, you know, there's, this would be a complex issue whether on a case, this case or that case, could um, we wait? I think it would probably have to do with the timing. Um, is the project about to be built? Um, um, that would be the, the mitigation measure, if you will, that has been contemplated for years and other developments have been funding it. Because um, you know, if it was about to happen, I think that you might have a better justification to say, yeah, it'd be better uh, as a condition of approval of your project to wait until this project is done because there'd be an impact related to you building your project at the same time as this traffic improvement was being built. But in the abstract, I think it would be difficult to hold up a project um, based upon something that may be built in the future or at some point in the more distant future. Well, here's where I'm having a problem, okay? I'm just, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a guy that got elected to council and I design houses for a living, okay? So I approach this like the average Joe, I think. Try to look at it in a commonsensical way. And so I've, I've got a question for you. Why the hell go through an EIR process if we've got something that we know is an environmental problem existing right now in our town, cars sitting out there on Holly, idling away, burning fossil fuels, polluting their neighborhood over there on the east side, and we're not doing anything about it except building more projects that we know as soon as those projects get built, they are going to impact that. Meanwhile, we say we, I, no disrespect here, Mr. Savay, but I understand your answer. We've got a project. We think, you know, we're going to try and mitigate things out there at 101 in Holly. I'm thinking to myself, okay, that's fine, but how, number one, how is fixing things out at 101 in Holly going to mitigate the whole corridor when, when the problem a big part of the problem is not people trying to get from San Carlos out to Holly. It's in the afternoons, people coming off that highway, and if we make it better so they can get off faster, it's just going to create more traffic on Holly. But that's number one. Number two, I don't know, when, when you try to do these things, buildable projects to fix infrastructure problems, seems to me you build the project first, see what the results are, and, di and ask yourself, did we fix the problem? For instance, when we, when we built the grade separation, we were told this is going to improve traffic in San Carlos. If you remember the old days, sitting there, you know, here comes the train, bing, 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 you know, every time I go to Redwood City, I'm reminded of this. 
and you're stuck. So we said, let's build a grade separation, traffic will smooth, you know, be more smooth. We built the grade separation. I think for the most part, we've got some other issues that were unintended consequences of the grade separation and the whole thing there. But for the most part, if you remember those days of sitting there waiting for the train to go by, it's an improvement. But we know it's an improvement because we built it, it's there, we, can, we live with it. So help me out here, why go through an EIR process if you can identify something that's an environmental problem, you know you're only going to make it worse, and the only solution is we're going to pay into a fund for something that's down the road that may or may not fix it. I, I'm sorry, I just feel like I'm being dishonest with the citizens of San Carlos as an elected official saying, that's the solution. Live with it for five, ten years. We, there's nothing we could do about it. It's, I don't, why, why go through an environment? It's called an environmental impact report. We can identify impacts to problems we already have, but we're not going to do anything about it except kick the can down the road. I just, I'm just and, and if I may start well, out here, one of the big problems um, really is that the, the financing to build the project is anticipated the Holly 101 project yeah. is anticipated to come from the fees paid by development. So if we don't do any development, we're not going to have any money to pay for the 101 project. It's not going to it's not going to be funded, it's not going to happen. And so, you know, unless you want to do a tax measure and you want to say, and this would be a perfectly reasonable way to do it, go to the people in San Carlos and say, "Hey, look, we've allowed you to live here, develop here, increase the size of your home here for years." And that's created this problem on Holly, and now you need to tax yourselves to pay for this project. And it'll, you know, it's in the twenty million dollar range, in terms of this. You know, if we're not willing to do that, the only way that the project's ever going to get paid for is through development fees, and that's what we've, as a community, chosen to do up to this point. In terms of, you know, whether or not your opinion on um, would the project that's being proposed fix the full problem and the timing and all that, I'd, I'd leave that to the, the traffic engineers of the world to, to talk about more so than myself. But just in terms of how we would go about paying for a project of that magnitude, there's really only two choices, either development impact fees or a large-scale community tax measure. Well, I'm going to let other people speak, but just one more, one more comment to that is, the other problem I see with the solution of, well, we're going to allow development and the development will create fees so that we can do this mitigation measure. The, thing, the other thing I'm afraid of is we, we do the mitigation measure, but by, by getting the money from development and there's more people and so forth, is you're really not mitigating. You're, you're making an improvement but the additional traffic that you're bringing in, you're not going to change the status of things. You might make Kali Maybe you made Holly a four-lane mm -hmm. deal, but because of all the development you did to pay for it, you're back to where you started. You still have a clogged drain. Well, you know, maybe I'll refer this to Mr. Save just for confirmation, but I believe that the numbers that are being used in the general plan and the Holly report look at that long-term build-out. So they're anticipating the development that's occurring between now and then and saying that that project will improve the traffic situation, not that as it not as it exists today, but as the general plan uh, uh, assumes the community would exist in the future. So, That's so correct. I, right? Yeah. So I, yeah, I don't think you're quite correct there. In, in your in the, the the transportation analysis that's included in the environmental document considers general plan and build out for the cumulative scenario. And so what you've, what you've created with your environmental document for this specific project is a way to determine that project contribution to the adverse traffic effect. Then you can make a determination on what that, um, the financial contribution that traffic, this, this project would have to do towards those um, transportation improvements. So um, I am a CEQA practitioner, so I, would, I just want to emphasize that this, this is a worthwhile process for the city. Uh, let's go down here and then we'll go to you. All right. Um, I don't know who this question is for. Well, hopefully one of the four of you can answer this. Uh, Mr. Zave, you said that 
the transit village, like every other development, has to pay into a traffic mitigation fund. Is there a formula for that, or can do we just pick a number? How, how does that work? Yes, there is a formula in the uh, in the or there's an ordinance, a traffic mitigation fee ordinance. So there is a formula in there. I, I don't have it in front of me, but yes, is it is it based on the cost of the project, the expected profit from the project, uh, the acreage, it's on size, size of the project, project uh, and its direct impact. I think it might be square footage based, mm -hmm. if I recall correctly. I don't know if the public works director, I don't think he's still here, but my recollection is based on square footage and a, a nexus study was done. Council considered the impact fee uh, and it was also the, the fee was intended to be like the city manager mentioned, um, to be exacted over a period of time to pay for those uh, it big enough, the fee was big enough per square feet, square footage, uh, to pay for this uh, construction project over time. So approximately what is the, what are they expected to pay in the traffic mitigation or pay into this traffic mitigation fund? I think that we can probably dig that number up for you in the next, uh, we'll try and dig it up. Okay. I don't have it right. That's okay. Me, so no, at, at, at some point along the, line, along the line, it would be useful. And that would be in addition to any in lieu fee that they would pay for affordable housing? Yes. And park dedication fees, school fees, building permit fees. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Can I just respond to um, that particular issue and the, and the one that the mayor has been raising really quickly? It's an issue that CEQA has addressed and the case law has addressed um, quite substantially even more over the last few years that where with all of the projects that are being planned in the area, there is expected to be a cumulative traffic impact. It's usually traffic. And there has been identified an improvement to fix that if it's reasonably clear that that improvement is going to go forward and that the project can pay its fair share to construct that improvement, then the project's contribution to the overall impact can be determined to be less than significant on the basis of the payment into the fund to create that improvement. So that is something that is um, blessed by the CEQA laws and by the case law. Just so you know. Now that doesn't mean that at the end of the day you have to decide to approve the project in its current form or at all. The only thing we're addressing here is the sufficiency of the EIR to carry you forward to that next step. One quick question. Are you allowed to say in any of this process, this is what, you know, we've studied this as a city. We've come up with this 101 interchange fix. I've got a question about that later, but we've come up with this fix. So seven years down the road, we do the project, the fix is in. We look at the traffic, we still have a problem. Are we allowed any kind of caveat to go back to the developer and say, we did the fix that we had in the EIR, we still have a problem, we think you're, you know, we're, we're attributing part of that problem to your 281 units and, and your commercial development here. We need to do something else to fix the problem and we're coming to you for the funds, generally, part of the funds. Generally, no. CEQA is a okay. pros takes a prospective look and um, you need, need to be correct. Okay. Well, in fact, that, that, may, uh, that may emphasize the importance of taking a uh, liberal view of what the foreseeable projects are and impacts because you can't afford to be wrong. Right, and to that's going to, I'll let other people ask some questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask the question, how does Holly 101 fix the problem of Holly Street Corridor? That fix, you know, it's a barbell. That's one end of the barbell. You still got the other end. That's so. for the experts on traffic to You're answer. Right. Yeah. My recollection is that that was the feasible, the only feasible um, improvement that was identified years ago in order to alleviate the congestion on Holly, which, as you have mentioned, has been acknowledged for a number of years. Yeah. Okay. 
Somebody else uh, down here for a moment. Mr. Yes. Uh, yes. Have an answer to Council Member Collins' question. Uh, I forgot the, the question. Traffic. What was it? He probably yeah, knows. Yeah, mitigation yeah. fees oh. are five hundred and seventy-six thousand three hundred and eighty-six dollars. I thought uh, Council Member Collins had asked what the formula was. Oh, I thought he asked the dollars. Oh, I asked both. Okay. Yeah. That, well, I don't have the formula. Uh, this evening, but I did have the dollar at least. All right, the dollar, you think it was five hundred thousand? Five hundred and seventy-six thousand three hundred and eighty-six. Thank you. Um, the um, let me talk a little bit about, or turn a little bit now to uh, visual impacts. Um, when I read resolution, the infamous resolution two thousand three dash seventy-nine, uh, there's this item in it four point eight four nine, and it states, uh, and I'll just read it here. Project architecture should incorporate varying heights that are sensitive to the scale and massing of east side residential areas and accommodate and preserve significant views. And so my initial question is, I have a couple of parts here, but the initial question is, um, my understanding is that resolution is effectively part of the city's general plan. It was incorporated by reference um, uh, when the general plan was modified. Uh, that seems to me to indicate that at the time that that was drafted, the people who drafted it felt that there were at least some significant views that were at risk. Um, and so I'm a little bit confused. I've always been a little bit confused in reading the EIR analysis that um, basically my understanding came to the conclusion that there are no significant view impacts. So I, I see a dichotomy between the analysis that's in the EIR and the perspective of, I presume, former council members um, and staff at the time. May, may I add to that just one uh, point as well, is when the grade separation was put in, that was an issue, was uh, significant views from the east side. Yeah, and, that's what this and, is derived from, from the Berm project. Okay, right. all right, very good. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm sorry if I, if I missed the, the point of your question. I'll try to answer that, and if I don't, please, please correct me, and I'll, I'll try to emphasize more. Um, I first want to talk about the grade separation project, and um, you're, you're correct. With the grade separation project, there was a determination that um, implementation of the project would have an adverse effect on views from the east side to the hills. And if I recall correctly, that was determined to be a significant unavoidable effect. That was based on the um, uh, the situation that that was present prior to the construction of the berm. Um, the berm is now in place. Um, our analysis has to look at uh, the change in existing conditions that would result from implementation of the um, San Carlos Transit Village project. The existing conditions include the presence of the berm. So the berm is already blocking some of the views from the east side of the hills. Um, we would be building on the other side. I'm sorry? Please, please don't. This is actually council staff discussion. So the berm is blocking, potentially block, or partially blocking some of those views. The project is going to be built on the other side of that berm. Um, our analysis is based on the existing condition with the berm. Um, that's why we have a determination in the environmental document that the visual impacts would be less than significant. Um, um, if I may interrupt, I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you, you explaining that for the record, because that... Uh, uh, that was very clear from the EIR. The point I'm making is actually a little bit different. 2003-79 was adopted after the berm project was approved, after the EIR for the berm project was, uh, the determination was made, hey, it's got a significant impact, but it's unavoidable, and we need to do this, public needs override, we're going to do it. And I understand that, uh, even though I don't accept, as Mr. Rubens knows from many of our long discussions, I understand the concept in CEQA about how that resets the baseline. Mm -hmm. Hence your point about looking at the incremental impact. My point is actually simpler. 2003-79 says a group of city leaders, after that project was approved, said there are significant views. One might almost argue that, um, and you know, different people can look at the same data and come to different conclusions, but one could almost argue, hey, we don't need to actually do the analysis because it was already done and determined that there was, there was at least some significant view that was going to be impacted. By, by development. That's really my point. And maybe another way of asking that is, is was that perspective that I see codified in 2003-79 factored into the analysis that was actually done in the EAR? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. In other words, did, did you go back and, and factor in, okay, these people thought there were significant views here? Um, to the best of my knowledge, that was factored in. We looked at um, what the general plan said about views within the city, um, what the city, the general plan determined were significant views, um, view corridors within the city, and we based our determination of impacts on the uh, visual resources in the box and uh, of the proposed project on, on that information from the city general plan. Okay. Um, if I may, let me just tag on to this because it, it is a good launching point for another question I wanted to ask, which may actually be an Anna, Anna question. Um, one of the things that I found very striking about going through uh, the EIR analyses, and I'm using it in the context of an example, the example of the loss of significant views, but it actually percolates through to a number of different things. Um, there's a, there seems to be an implicit assumption that the, the impact is linear to the amount of view being lost. So for example, uh, losing, I know it's not done mathematically this way, but losing, uh, having, if you start out having 30% of your view obfuscated and you go to 40%, that that's considered to be the same thing as going from 90 to 100 because they're both a 10% change. And I have to say from a common sense point of view, that actually makes no sense to me. Okay, because, because losing the last little bit of something is far more significant than losing a little bit kind of along the way. And, and the, the thing that, the example that came to my mind, and I say this because I discovered to my shock when I was campaigning last year that I've been losing hair on the back of my head, but since nobody ever takes pictures of me from behind until somebody did in the campaign, I didn't know that. Um, that's part of the reason why guys often do comb-overs towards the end of going bald, because they're really trying to... <laughs> uh, so, uh, I would just like to get some, some perspective on are we allowed to use what to me would be a more commonsensical standard of looking at thresholds saying, yeah, you know, when you go from losing the first chunk of a view, that's maybe acceptable, but losing the last chunk of a view because it's totally gone, that's unacceptable, even if it's the same increment. So, I'm not sure who answers that, but. Well, I'll, I'll try to answer that, and I certainly would welcome any further explanation. Um, the, the, the whole with the idea of the loss of the view is um, first establishing what the city considers important viewpoints. So that, that's outlined in, in the document, in the setting. This is what the city says in this general plan or general knowledge. The, these are what we think are the important views. Um, and it tries to look at, um, uh, views generally open to the public, not, not individuals' views. For example, if, if you live in a high-rise and you have a beautiful view out of the window and a high-rise goes up next to you, that, that blocks your view. You know, that, that's not generally considered a, an adverse change in the environment under CEQA because, you know, private views are not protected under CEQA. So when we make a determination on what, based on city documentation and past documentation, what the city itself has gone on record is saying, these are the important views from the city or to the city. And then um, we identify those viewpoints or the vistas, um, and then whether or not the proposed project itself is going to have an adverse effect on um, those adopted views or view sheds. Um, there's not a strict formula that, that, that says um, if we lose half of it, it's less as significant. If we lose 51% of it, then it's significant and we need to mitigate. Um, it's it's really based on a professional judgment and uh, specific to um, whatever proposed project you're evaluating and the setting in which that that project is being constructed. Which, if if I may interrupt, just in the interest of time, given uh, the conversation you and I had at the last meeting, at the end of the day, when the when a council member is choosing to looking at elements of the EIR to decide if they're sufficient, it's our judgment that has to apply there. I mean, we we can accept your judgment and say, hey, that makes sense to me. Yes, of course. Or, or, but it, it's, it's the judgment factor that comes into play. When, when you ap adopt or deny the, the environmental document, you've said we agree with the conclusions of the document analysis that's included in that document, or we don't agree with the analysis that's included in that document. And, and, and I, I know I keep emphasizing this, but that's just because both for myself being relatively new and, and others up here as well, it, it's there's a natural tendency to try to look for, well, what are the rules I have to apply? Mm -hmm. And there are rules, but to some extent, those rules are apply your judgment. 
and and that's a that's a critical distinction that I want to make sure that we all keep in yeah, mind. And as we've always said for me, visual is a very difficult impact to evaluate. And um, you know, it, unfortunately, if I can see the project, that doesn't mean it's necessarily an adverse effect or a significant impact. Um, I'm going to address both the visual issue briefly and then the judgment. The CEQA checklist questions upon which thresholds are generally formed. In this particular issue, the view issue, it asks whether the project would substantially degrade the existing character or quality of the site and its surroundings. So I think the degree may come into it in substantially. So for instance, 10%, no matter what it might be, may not be a substantial degradation. In terms of uh, the judgment on the EIR, Mr. K is, is correct that, and you are correct, that the EIR, in order for it to be certified, you do have to find that the EIR reflects your independent, the city's independent judgment and analysis. If you choose to come to a different conclusion than is currently in the EIR, that would actually mean that you would need to alter the text of the EIR, and whatever you do needs to be based upon substantial evidence that's in the record. So the analysis that's in the EIR now is obviously based upon the, uh, you know, a number of scientists and technical technical experts that have come together to put together the document. That doesn't mean necessarily that you, that you have to find that that reflects your independent judgment in the end. But if you want to come to a different conclusion and to change the EIR, that change also needs to be reflected in your findings of certification and needs to be supported by evidence that's in the record. Um, Mr. Mayor, may I just ask one quick follow-on question? Sure. I'm following this very as close as I can, so go ahead. And, and, <laughs> and I apologize for occupying the baton here, but this, right. this is sort of dovetailing into stuff. Um, one of my other questions that I was going to ask was, when we talk, I, I've seen that language as well in my review of, of uh, the sequel legislation about uh, information in the record, discussion it, in the record. Mm -hmm. um, my conclusion is that that is, that is not limited to, for example, things like general plans, specific plans and whatnot, that those are part of the record because they are part of the corpus that defines the city's thing. But there are other things that can go beyond that. It, yes. And, and, Our and, discussion here is part of the record. Well, that was what I was getting to. Now, and presumably there's some standard that says we can't just capriciously on a lark say, oh, well, we're going to change something else. But if we have, if, if a majority of the council decides that there is reasonable substantive and they can explain in some articulate fashion what it is, that too becomes part of the record. Yes, but there still needs to be substantial evidence to back up the in, conclusions. Evidence yes. Yes. Right. Sorry, it can't just be we all strongly feel that X is the case. It has right. to be some, some thing we can point to to say here's why we believe X. Yes. Okay, thank you. How do you create substantial evidence? For instance, let's stick with the views. Okay. All the hard ones. Well, no, here's, uh, to be serious here, um, substantial evidence. I, for instance, here's one of the things that I think about with this project in mm -hmm. terms of the views. Uh, we allowed for 1001 El Camino to be built. And, you know, we pushed some things around for that to happen, for the, make, it, make it a doable project for the developer. And there it is, it's built. It's four stories. It sits on the other side of El Camino. And I just imagine that building moving to uh, the side of the El Camino where the transit village is proposed. And instead of having one that's one block long, now I've got four or five buildings on the north side and uh, two buildings on the south side of Holly Street that substantially look like 1001 El Camino. That to me is a degrada degradation of views in San Carlos, be it for people who live on the east side and drive up and down their, their streets, they're the public, and for uh, people who drive along Old County Road, be it people that are transversing through our city from Redwood City to Belmont, or for 
people who live in town and are just going over to Home Depot and coming back and so forth. Already, to me, there's a degradation of views because of 1001 El Camino. To me, again, putting six of those on this side of the El Camino, is that evidence enough or do I need something else? It's more challenging with visual because it is a very subjective topic. You know, it's a, it's a lot right. simpler with traffic and noise where there are very clear numerical standards. Mm -hmm. Where the question is whether the project substantially degrades the visual character, it is largely going to be within your purview to make that determination. If you, you know, the visual simulations have been done the experts that the city hired have opined that it's not a significant impact. However, should you choose to come to a different conclusion and feel that that's justifiable, you would need to alter the environmental impact report and then we might need to discuss what steps would have to be taken once you were to do that if a majority of the city council were to move in that direction. Okay. All right. Thank you. I could just add, I'm glad you brought up visual character because I think your, your um, description about traveling on El Camino Real and the presence of the buildings really is not changing the, the views, but more the visual character of the experience of driving on El Camino Real. No, I, actually I mentioned, I, I did not talk about El Camino Real, not to be argumentative, but I was talking about if you're driving, uh, what more concerns me is when you're traversing Old County Road. And, and, you know, because right now when you drive Old County Road, despite the great separation, you can still see the San Carlos Hills mm -hmm. to, to the west and, you know, a lot of blue sky. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I'm not trying to complicate right. things. But I don't believe Old County Road is a scenic road as, as described in the city's general plan. And um, typically, um, on a personal note, I, pr I like to drive. So I, I am aware of my surroundings when I'm driving, mm -hmm. but um, most analyses for visual impacts will read that driver's concentration is typically focused on driving, not looking at the view. So in, in giving your um, you know, substantial evidence, that, that those are the things that you're going to have to consider if you decide to change the conclusion um, presented in the environmental document. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I'd like to make a suggestion, and you may or may not like it. It's 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a feeling that yourself, certainly, and Mr. Olbert have many more questions to ask. And I don't think even if we stood this evening, we could possibly get them all answered. Mm -hmm. uh, so my suggestion is that we continue this until the next meeting. I'm fine with that. Unless somebody Because I have a feeling it's going to go a lot more than 1130 and a lot more than 1145. Yeah. Yeah. And this way, I think it'll be fresher. Mm -hmm. Mr. City Manager, is it appropriate for the next meeting that we will have a couple of three hours to uh, to vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis your uh, possible agenda? I will, I will uh, do my best to endeavor to clear the items from the uh, January 28th agenda to the extent I can. I think there are I mean, we, we started at 10 o'clock. We started discussing at 10. We've only been doing it an hour. Sure. So, yeah. I mean, we're going to go, we're going to have at least two or three hours of this. So, I'm hopeful that we could start God willing, by eight o'clock next time. And, yeah, I mean, uh, my guess is it feels to me like the council is probably two, two and a half hours away. Okay, um, at yeah, the pace we're going. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I just wanted to make sure. And like I said, we'll do no, we'll I, do our best yeah. to endeavor to clear as much off the agenda as we can. There are other business items, Understand. as there were tonight, sure. based on timing that just have to okay. come forward. So, M Mr. City, do I need to make a motion to continue this, yeah. or is this? Yeah, this item um, would need to be continued to a date certain. A motion, a motion. motion would be okay. required. Make a motion to uh, continue this item until uh, our next uh, city council meeting, which would be uh, January 28th. 28th. Second. Christine, can I just do all in favor? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Good suggestion. I didn't want to stay here until 4 in the morning. You beat me to it. Uh, or adjourned. <laughs>